Okay, we're live on YouTube. Is the six eight zero the last three digits? Is that sh you, Chief White? I believe it is. If I recall correctly. Okay. It's coming on. It looks like. <laughs> well, I just allowed it to talk. So, Chief White, is that you? Yeah, that, that's me. I'm sorry. Still got to do okay. it both ways. No worries. All right, I think I, I just want to make sure I got everyone um, in the waiting room, and I think I did. Okay. So I think we're set. I think we're at six. We are at six. Okay, at this time, we'll call the uh, City Council work session to order. Clerk, if you please call the roll, and remember to everybody to state your location. Councilperson Whitman? Councilperson Whitman. He's trying to get off mute. 
Here. Monroe, Michigan. Um, Ike Wangeli. He's excused. Vining. Uh, Germany. Present, City of Monroe. Lamore. Here, City of Monroe. Felder. Here, City of Monroe. Mayor Clark. Mayor Clark. Okay. I Present, uh, City of Monroe, Michigan. Okay. And I know yourself, Clerk. Uh, City of Monroe, here at City Hall. Excellent. So we have um, work session this evening, presentations on the proposed capital improvement program. And uh, Mr. Pastu, I know that there's um, uh, some presentations this evening, so I'll let you manage the uh, order in which you wish to do so. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure if Michelle's made me a uh, uh, co-host yet. Uh, I did. Okay. Uh, As you get started, I see uh, Councilwoman Vining is, uh, is present. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Thank uh, you. Location, please, Councilwoman. Good evening, Kelly Vining, City of Monroe. Thank you. Well, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, tonight, we'd like to present the uh, Capital Improvements Program uh, a little bit, uh, you know, later than what we normally do, but uh, obviously the uh, uh, two mil uh, referendum uh, issue that was before the voters uh, that was subsequently approved uh, had an impact on us uh, trying to assess what this uh, program would look like for the uh, following year. And so uh, I'm going to, you know, uh, the agenda is just to have uh, Mr. Green again uh, provide a background related to the capital improvements program. I'll discuss uh, the factors in developing the CIP as well as uh, the administrative request. Uh, Mr. Leroy will go through the water and wastewater utilities uh, uh, proposed uh, projects and then uh, city engineer Patrick Lewis will go through uh, road and, and, and other uh, infrastructure projects uh, uh, for the focus tonight is while it's a five-year capital improvements program uh, we're focusing a lot on the uh, the uh, upcoming fiscal 21-22 uh, budget that, that we'll go through so with that if I uh, Mr. Green if you just provide a background and introduction thank you Mr. Pass too um Mr. Mayor, members of City Council, Jeffrey Green, Director of Community Development. Uh, I will provide uh, a brief introduction on the capital improvements program. Uh, not so much about the, the budget itself, but more about the general information related to that. So the term capital improvements is intended to define large scale projects that are of a fixed cost. Things that we typically think of such as parks, roads, infrastructure of various types, fire trucks and those kind of things. And the implementation of these capital improvements results in new or expanded public facilities and services or a continuation of projects or programs that are already established. The capital improvements program budget is a multi-year schedule of public improvements that covers six years for the city of Monroe. In application, the CIP budget is a list of capital items which acknowledges and identifies current and anticipated demands of the city. Uh, the CIP budget is also recognition that demand for new and improved facilities and services generally outpaces the revenues needed to satisfy all demands. Hence the budget's prioritized list of projects. The capital improvements program is typically composed of two parts. First is the capital budget, which covers the first year of the program and includes all the projects to be funded in the upcoming fiscal year. This is where the actual dollars come into play. Second is the capital improvements program covering the next five years. This five year span provides a snapshot of the projects that departments and agencies are proposing for upcoming years. These two have values attached, albeit they're estimated. Projects may require only a, a one-time expenditure or they may be phased in over multiple years, but the capital Impro improvements program budget provides transparency of operation in that it allows not only elected officials, but also the community at large to see upcoming fiscal year's budget, as well as the estimated cost of projects that span a number of years. So the capital improvements program 
is a planning tool for directing the initiation of necessary and desirable public improvements, but it can also be looked at as a historic document. The program through its proposals provides insights into those projects already completed by the community, essentially becoming the foundation upon which today's program is built. As such, annual CIP expenditures, those which are a part of the capital budget and involve actual spending should be tied to the city's master plan. Ideally, every project request that we receive should evolve from the plan if possible. Regarding this year's budget, it is relatively straightforward. It's very similar to budgets that we've seen uh, by this count or this council has seen in the past. And I, as I indicated, I'm not gonna go into individual projects. I'll leave that to other department heads here tonight and Mr. Pastu. Uh, I will note that the year's proposed general fund allocation is just over $840,000. And the city of Monroe has historically spent approximately one mil of, of general fund dollars toward the capital budget. So this year's allocation is slightly less than that. Uh, if we're looking at one mil being approximately $883,000. The total CIP budget this year is over 35 million. As for the next steps in this process, the proposed budget will go to the Citizens Planning Commission meeting next week uh, for a public hearing and a recommendation by the CPC at that time. And the question often arises as to why the Planning Commission is involved in a budgeting process, especially related to capital improvements program, and why they must make a recommendation to city council regarding the CIP budget. Short answer, it's mandated by the state enabling legislation, specifically Michigan Planning Enabling Act, PA 33 of 2008. It's also required by city charter. Once the CPC has reviewed the proposed budget and held a public hearing, it will then transmit its recommendation to city council. City charter then requires that council conduct a public hearing on the CIP budget the third week of February. The charter also mandates that city council adopt the budget by the last day of February. Under this current city count or under the current city council meeting schedule, this means that the budget will be acted on at the second council meeting of February, which is the third week of February following the public hearing. Uh, I'd be happy, Mr. Mayor, to answer any questions regarding the process uh, of the capital improvements budget. Uh, otherwise, that concludes my uh, introduction. Any questions for uh, Mr. Mr. Green? I'm looking at the council, I don't see any. All right, um, Mr. Pastu. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> as I've done uh, in past years, uh, you know, just do a, and I'm going to go quickly through it. Is factors in developing uh, the uh, capital improvements program: uh, their financial, economic, quality of life, operational, uh, infrastructure, asset management programs, regulatory, and technology. Uh, financial factors. Uh, again, I repeat this, uh, but I did add another bullet here. Uh, you know, I do think uh, in light of uh, the DTE uh, plant and, and its future tax taxable value, you know, that the city needs to address all of its major infrastructure needs in the next 15 years. Uh, uh, you know, coal fire plants, I'm not sure, uh, you know, where the future is, uh, but I see it diminishing and, and clearly uh, uh, it's in excess of 40% uh, of our uh, tax base here in the, the city of Monroe. And, and it's something that we need to be aware of and adjust to, in getting our infrastructure and facilities uh, uh, so that we can transition from that point going forward. I did put uh, another item here, a concern with uh, commercial office values, nothing specific, but a general sense that given the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic that uh, operations have changed and, and I'm not sure where the, the values will be in the, in the future. Uh, those remain to be seen. But again, it just adds another financial uh, consideration in, in trying to address our infrastructure needs uh, over the next uh, 15 years. Economic uh, factors, again, making land use and capital improvement decisions uh, that allow the city to harness current momentum that we have with Economic uh, opportunity, economic development opportunities. Obviously, the River Raisin uh, National uh, uh, Battlefield. I got the sequence in there. Uh, Battlefield uh, National Park. Uh, um, 
is a, is a great opportunity. And I know many of you uh, recently uh, toured the, the new education facility and, and once uh, it's able to open to the public, I think uh, we all realize it'll have a phenomenal impact uh, regarding the number of visitors that uh, will hopefully come to our community and in, in, uh, resurgence of downtowns, continue to try and uh, to capitalize on that. Uh, uh, you know, we do as a city have some tremendous physical and historic assets in here that we can leverage uh, in, in uh, repositioning ourselves uh, in the future. Uh, again, not being so reliant on the, the DTE plant for our uh, ongoing uh, revenues uh, for operation and capital purposes. And then uh, obviously the telegraph corridor, lazy site uh, redevelopment in particular, uh, you know, we hope are hopeful that uh, uh, we'll bring about additional redevelopment along that uh, corridor as well. Quality of life, uh, build on our unique historic uh, assets. Obviously the river uh, raisin, uh, beautiful natural beauty as well as recreational opportunities. Continue to invest in more walkable communities, certainly with the recently uh, past uh, millage uh, that does allow for uh, uh, some of those funds to go toward uh, um, trails and, and that type of development. Uh, and we'll probably later on in the regular meeting we'll talk a little bit more about uh, uh, the trail uh, advisory committee and where that's at. Uh, but also, you know, use that as a, you know, means of uh, improving the quality of life here in the community. Uh, streetscape, traffic calming improvements, uh, uh, you'll see those obviously in the, the DDA, uh, but also throughout the city. And then continue to invest in park improvements, again, uh, improving the quality of life for our uh, residents. Uh, operational factors, uh, you know, certainly we look at what we can do uh, by reducing operating expenditures. Sometimes there's a capital uh, investment that, uh, that helps with improving uh, our operating expenses as well as uh, the customer experience uh, uh, that we uh, offer to our uh, customers and, and then also build in some system reliability and redundancies. And you'll see a lot of that uh, more related to some of the utility infrastructure, but it's critical to, to provide that uh, reliability. And then the other thing with it is, is considering uh, other uh, funding alternatives, uh, you know, such as uh, using by way of example, the Enterprise Fleet Management Program. And, and I'll talk just in a, briefly about that in a couple minutes, but those are aspects of it from an operational factor that we consider from the, uh, the manager uh, and staff uh, related to developing the, the CIP. Infrastructure asset management program, I think in many ways, uh, the city's in, in a very good uh, uh, situation to evaluate what these needs are. Certainly the man, uh, mandated for, for water and sewer system uh, with the asset management system that uh, Mr. Uh, Leroy uh, has uh, implemented. Uh, obviously, Mr. Uh, uh, Lewis, uh, with the annual road street condition evaluation, uh, is, a, is a tremendous tool for evaluating the, those needs. Sidewalk evaluation that goes along with it, which I think will probably be even ramped up now that we have the dedicated millage. Uh, the city has adopted park plans, which gives it a, a good assessment of what the future infrastructure needs. Um, you know, and it, they're important tools to prioritize project uh, replacement uh, versus capital maintenance, uh, extending those useful life. Uh, and again, now that uh, we have some more funding, I think in particular with roads is that uh, Mr. Lewis will have a greater opportunity for some more capital maintenance, actually a couple of projects that he has listed in there. And then coordination with uh, surface and underground projects uh, are elements of uh, the, the asset management planning that goes Regulatory factors, primarily focused uh, water system, uh, we've talked about in the past, like copper regulations, PFAS, uh, and certainly with the sewer uh, system, sanitary sewer system, implement uh, corrective action plan. Uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Leroy will talk uh, a couple of projects that we, well, in particular, that we have uh, currently going, but also in the future uh, projects that we need to address related to that corrective action plan. Uh, technology factors, uh, you know, again, the Technology is changing uh, quite rapidly, and, and certainly the pandemic has uh, changed our operations significantly uh, in many ways for the better as a result. Uh, but we do need to, again, tie this back with operational efficiency, customer experience, system reliability, and safety as well. Um, more and more mm -hmm. consideration. Uh, the information technology study from uh, uh, that was implemented was uh, very, has been shown success already in improving uh, 
process management and our workflow system. Still more to go, but uh, has had great uh, impact on uh, our operations. Uh, again, numerous applications in the utilities department, such as the meter replacement and the ability to monitor flows, find out where problems may exist. Uh, and the one thing I don't have in there is at some point in time, I really do think we need to start uh, putting together some sort of plan to integrate cameras. Uh, uh, as I said, there's multiple applications that can be used from security as well as monitoring traffic flow, uh, those type of things, parking, uh, you know, turnover. There, there's a lot of applications that would be beneficial. And, and I, I think maybe with this, hopefully with this next uh, coming uh, budget in uh, fiscal 21, uh, 22, that we may put, at least put something together so we can have a cohesive plan related to that. Uh, Going forward, uh, we have uh, proposed a, a budget of $10,230,100. Uh, I did, uh, I think part of it is in, in the packet there, you had a line item uh, that listed all of the projects that you have uh, there. Uh, yeah, 43 projects uh, proposed for, for fiscal, uh, upcoming fiscal year, which is pretty, pretty uh, ambitious. Uh, but uh, but we think doable. Uh, most of it, uh, better than half of it, is related to streets. Uh, certainly, the millage uh, that was uh, recently adopted goes a long way toward that. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the funding with that. Um, but we also have money and uh, to continue the branding of science, mostly this upcoming year with uh, um, parks. Uh, uh, I'm actually looking at uh, having. Uh, uh, Russell Design, who's been involved with a number of uh, projects with us, kind of uh, work with the staff in putting together the uh, proposals and soliciting bids for those uh, the signs. Uh, dumpster enclosures, uh, we're talking a lot about downtown and, and trying to improve the aesthetics uh, as well as the, uh, uh, the health of uh, public health of the downtown by consolidating um, uh, refuse collection and getting it off the sidewalk. Uh, technology, we have 75,000 budgeted there. Uh, sidewalks, uh, we ramped up uh, what we've historically put in there. Again, this is coming from the dedicated millage. Uh, we've got some facility and site improvements. Uh, the largest is uh, we have funding in there for redoing uh, the parking lot here at City Hall. Uh, DPS uh, fire uh, uh, equipment vehicles, uh, we actually uh, have 130,000 uh, budgeted in the uh, uh, stores and equipment uh, fund uh, for uh, equipment replacement. Uh, we will be talking with council about uh, transitioning our uh, police department vehicles to the uh, enterprise uh, fleet management program this year, uh, thereby it ends up reducing the, the cost, uh, at least the outlay that we will have for the upcoming year, uh, as well as there's uh, 40,000 in there for uh, 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 purchase of a, a used uh, ambulance for the uh, fire department uh, to replace a piece of equipment, but also maybe use that for a lot of the primary medical runs uh, as well. Uh, we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Parks and trails, uh, we have uh, uh, 183,500 in there. And then uh, we'll go into more detail with the water and sanitary sewer improvements, uh, those uh, totaling a little over uh, $3.8 million. So very ambitious program. Um, the funding sources, uh, uh, as Mr. Green alluded to, is uh, slightly less than the one mil that we've historically uh, put into the capital improvements program. Uh, we're taking some prior capital uh, projects, uh, appropriations, and carrying that forward, most notably uh, with the project uh, that we're looking at uh, at uh, Turnus uh, and in the industrial park. Uh, DDA is contributing 130. Major local street fund, just under 1.4 million. The two mil street levy, uh, not quite uh, 1.9 million in, in revenues. Stores and equipment, uh, 130,000. Information technology fund, 75. Uh, and the remainder uh, is coming from a water, uh, wastewater fund and, and the water funds. The one at the bottom is uh, we're looking at uh, some grant funding, um, but also the, the largest, and I think that should be MVF uh, bonds, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, motor vehicle uh, fund. Uh, we're looking at financing uh, uh, most uh, portion of the uh, industrial park uh, reconstruction of uh, the roads out there. 
And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to Mr. Lewis's presentation. So if you look at the upcoming uh, projects proposed, uh, again, we've got uh, 75,000 proposed for city hall improvements. Some of it will probably, most of it will likely be dedicated to the crumbling wall over on uh, First uh, Street. Uh, we're currently looking or working with uh, um, Ohio Restoration uh, to uh, give us some estimates as to what we can do. Uh, we've got 15 grand uh, proposed for the Opportunity Center, a couple of projects. One is the, the fan, uh, installing a fan in the gym that they think will help uh, make it a little more tolerable in the summer months. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, 200,000 for uh, City Hall parking lot improvements, uh, rough estimate there, and then the branded sign replacement. Uh, the uh, Parks and Recreation, uh, ongoing capital replacement, uh, again, uh, we're now looking at an annual basis of replacing either the playscape, uh, the uh, pavilions uh, at the parks as needed. So we're just, uh, and going forward, we're looking at putting 50 something thousand dollars every year just to keep up uh, with the, the maintenance of our parks. And then we've uh, proposed $80,000 uh, for design funding uh, for uh, Carnes Park uh, um, that we uh, will look to uh, develop uh, as well. So, you know, the one thing, uh, just giving a sense of where we're at with uh, our facilities, uh, you know, we've obviously put uh, quite a bit into City Hall uh, improvements. Uh, there's still some more, uh, uh, more safety uh, related projects that we're looking at uh, uh, this current fiscal year, but also uh, again, some improvements uh, with the site. Uh, uh, police station, we, uh, you know, have 6 million uh, in the capital improvements program, not funded at this point in time. Uh, again, I do think going back uh, to replacing uh, all of our major infrastructure in 15 years that uh, we need to give that consideration. Our fire stations, obviously we have uh, the new station on uh, third uh, in uh, very good condition, obviously, and then did a pretty significant renovation of uh, uh, the fire station on uh, North Custer. So we're feeling good there. Uh, obviously, we've put some more money into the uh, ALCC Opportunity Center, more work to be done on the Navarre Library. We're finalizing, uh, if council would, had recalled, we put funding in, uh, or we talked about uh, doing a request for uh, proposals, qualifications for architects, uh, you know, specializing in uh, community centers and uh, libraries to, to do an evaluation of what the future uh, programming and space needs would be there. And, and we're probably have that ready to, to, to be issued here within the next week. Uh, Battlefield Education Visitor Center, uh, all in all, you know, quite a significant investment has taken place uh, here, obviously with uh, the recent uh, renovations uh, uh, conducted with the foundation. Uh, Sawyer House, we put some money in again last year, uh, still more work to be done with it. And, and Dorsch Library, we did a pretty good uh, uh, improvement just uh, a couple of years ago. So by and large, most of our facilities are in a, in a pretty good shape. Uh, what I don't have on there is our uh, public works facility where at some point in time, again, uh, it, it'll be a consideration that may need to be addressed. Uh, going with road street funding, you know, this is again, a slide that I've used uh, last year and it's, it, it's a, we're in a much better position. Uh, as I said, the, the, the financial structure and sustainability of our major street funds, uh, the revenue stream is adequate uh, that we receive from the state and we, will show, we should be able to always maintain our major streets in, in, a, in, a, in a good condition. Uh, major uh, funds for eligible uh, for federal aid funding, again, we feel pretty good that we can uh, use those. The, uh, a few of the most recent ones were obviously uh, Front Street uh, from um, Telegraph into the downtown. And then uh, also uh, North Custer, we did some work there. Patrick will talk about what's proposed uh, for, uh, for next year with some uh, microsurfacing. State trunk line, although it's MDOT's responsibility, I'm starting to, you know, telegraph seems to be uh, getting uh, a little choppy. Uh, but city bridges, uh, you know, again, a, a, a millage proposal funded, uh, you know, approved by the voters uh, put our bridges in good condition. So. A lot of the major road infrastructure, you know, I do feel pretty good uh, that where we're headed. Um, the funding challenges, and again, I listed this last year, uh, local residential streets, 
will be improving with the millage. Uh, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Uh, and we've got an aggressive uh, program for, for 21. Sidewalks, again, will be improving with the use of the millage. Uh, alleys, no change. Uh, that it may be somewhere down the road, uh, you know, more of a long term. Uh, the industrial park off of Turnus, uh, proposed 2021 project uh, that we're looking at. And then St. Mary's Gardens, uh, we're looking at design this current year in 2021 with construction. And that will be a major project addressing some problems with uh, sanitary sewer backups that have existed in the past. But it's again, function of some of the, the storm sewer system and, and carrying through with, with the roads. So by and large, I think, you know, we're starting to see some improvement with, uh, with the road infrastructure as well. So uh, what's not included is uh, some of the major downtown infrastructure, parking improvements. Uh, still uh, look at that. Uh, as I said, citywide camera deployment until we have a, some sort of a, a plan in place. Uh, I'm reluctant to do much of anything with it. Uh, I do think at some point in time, we need to look at uh, street lighting, uh, energy conservation improvements, uh, uh, kind of uh, what they did at the uh, wastewater plant with uh, uh, contract that uh, saved uh, operating expenses uh, as a result of putting in the capital improvements and the, essentially the project paid for itself. Uh, strategic land acquisitions are not included in demolitions. Uh, brownfield redevelopment projects uh, such as uh, the uh, Lazy Boy redevelopment uh, site uh, is uh, not included. Uh, capital improvements uh, authority on uh, telegraph uh, or corridor improvement, I'm sorry. Uh, Funding is just beginning. Uh, we just started capturing this past July. Uh, we do have, uh, you know, I think from our end of it, uh, one item remaining uh, with the parking lot at the uh, education center at uh, the, the River Raisin uh, Battlefield National Park Education Center. Doesn't have anything in there necessarily for beautification projects. Didn't include anything with airport. Although I will tell you this afternoon, uh, council member Ico Angeli had suggested that we put uh, at least 15,000 to look into a feasibility study for a, uh, uh, a new terminal uh, with that. And so um, that was uh, one of his suggestions. The other suggestion that he had made was uh, looking at uh, whether to do some, uh, put some um, 100,000 in funding for, for Mill Race Park. Uh, uh, and again, I mentioned that I would mention that to the council tonight and you know we can consider it before it's, uh, uh, its adoption. So with that, I know it's a very quick uh, going over it quickly just to give you the background with it. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions you may have before I turn it over to uh, Mr. Leroy. Thank you, Vince. I'll see if there's any questions from the council members, either just raise your hand up or hit the raise a hand, see if there's any questions on the administrative report. I, I have a, I have a few, but I'll see if there's council members as well. Um, I guess I'll start because I. Oh, oh, go ahead, Brian. Uh, yeah, I just I had a few. Um, as far as the uh, uh, purchasing of a used ambulance for the fire department, is that ma mainly for paramedic runs? It's not going to be for transporting. Am I correct in assuming that? Primarily, yes, uh, but it's there in the event that it's needed. Uh, Chief White, I don't know if you want to jump in and, and talk about that. Um, obviously, uh, when COVID first hit, we were uh, kind of faced with a lot of challenges. And one of them was, you know, what would we do in the event that we uh, we were stuck without, you know, the ability to transport somebody. We're one of the few uh, departments in the county that do not have the ability to transport patients in the event of an emergency or even a mass casualty. Um, so we do have uh, our old ambulance, but it's, it's so far gone and out of, uh, you know, we've, the guys work pretty hard to try and put it back into service. But, you know, at this time, when it, there's too many things that are wrong with it that we're not comfortable uh, putting that back in service. So this kind of uh, became available. Um, the city of Wayne got two, uh, two brand new ambulances and, and they're putting it up for sale. It's a pretty good deal. It, it would also serve uh, probably as a, as a response um, to maybe take some of the miles off of the ladder as well. Thank you, Chief. Um, and, and as far as the uh, the other vehicles that we have is in, in backup as well, the suburban things like that, those are still going to be used as as emergency vehicles yep. as well. You know, responders. Yes, sir. Well. That, uh, yeah, the, the latter 
Um, the command uh, currently we run the command um, as a as a, the, the suburban as a command vehicle. Um, it also serves as an echo unit as well. So we would probably move the equipment from the suburban over to the uh, ambulance just to have it ready to go. Okay. All right. That's all the questions. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Other uh, questions from council members? Council members. I have, I have a couple of events on looking at the budget. I guess I'll go through those. I know we have uh, um, yet a couple other presentations. I'll make sure we get through everything. Um, I'll start with the ambulance question as well. Just follow up with uh, the councilman's question. I know that uh, years ago we put funding, I think it was near $100,000 into a, a, um, a vehicle for um, a re medical response. And so I guess I'm, I'd, I'd like to know the, the use of that vehicle and over the years and more recently and, you know, purchasing an ambulance, you know, it does imply that there'll be transport and that's not something that we're currently doing. And it's really a policy discussion with council in relation to our whole public safety delivery model that we're still working on. Um, and I don't know what certifications and what might be needed for um, transport. I'd like to, you know, get that later from, from the chief as well. But, you know, the $40,000, I mean, for an ambulance, if we're not transporting, we have other vehicles that are currently providing that service. So I'm trying to understand the, the use of an ambulance versus the medical response vehicle that we've um, outfitted before. And that, I mean, that's just something that I guess is a get back with council on. Um, i not looking to just necessarily debate it right now. I just want to know some information. So I might have some other questions as well. We could certainly come back, if you don't mind, Your Honor, at uh, the next meeting and talk a little bit more about it. Uh, I know Chief White and I have had some discussion about uh, some of those issues, and they're preparing, you know, kind of a brief presentation to go into a little more detail. Okay, thanks. Uh, you know, the, you mentioned the, the councilman's, I, I, the, the first one was on the airport. I, you know, I think we're, we're, we talked about that here a while ago, and I think at some point we really need to to uh, move forward with uh, some type of feasibility, what it's going to be and, and to move forward. Um, so, I, you know, and that's a, an amount that uh, I think could be obtained somewhere within the uh, discussions here. Uh, Mill Race Park, I think the, the, the you know, there's a, probably some outside funding that might uh, be available when you talk about M, uh, DNR trust funds and the, the grants that changed recently the legislation on availability for those park improvements. Just something to look at. I'm not sure what that amount is and how, but I think uh, we continue on with the Carnes Park as we've discussed, yet don't forget about the possibility of mill race. Uh, a couple of the non-funded items that you had on there, the land acquisition and demolition, might really a question, because I know we talked about it here the last year about, um, do we have any, my question is, do we have any carryover uh, dollars or locations regarding demolitions? I know we had to make some adjustments in our, our budget here uh, I think it's this, it was this fiscal year, but is there anything that's carrying over that is uh, items that are set for demolition and do we have the funding for it? I'm gonna rely on Ed to give us a quick update. I know there has been carryover from last fiscal year to the current fiscal year to go along with the existing appropriation, but he may be able to give you a, a little more detail on the amount that's fund available. Okay. I know carryover sometimes not the right word, Mr. Sell, because it's not from one budget year to the next. I'll correct myself yeah. there. But I just, I thinking as we move through, is that this year, is that still something that's going to happen? Uh, some locations, I understand we're getting into the 21, 22 budget year discussions here. I just wondered where we're at right now. That's all. Thanks. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, Hi. Ed Sell, Assistant City Manager, Finance Director. Um, so I guess there's a, a big picture there. So, I mean, it, you know, when we start out the budget year, and I don't, can't recall the exact number, but I think it's 100, 125,000 that we just, in general, budget for demolitions. And uh, the CDBG budget that we approved, uh, if I remember right, had about $100,000 in it for, for demolitions, blight, blight issues in general. Uh, but I believe those could be used for demolitions. But, um, in terms of where we ended last year, we did have some demolition projects that were approved, I want to say in May or June, and they didn't get done by the end of the June. So that funding did carry over this year. Uh, I don't recall exactly off the top of my head how much that was, but that is one, one area where some costs did carry over into this fiscal year. 
And we did have, uh, I want to say around $75,000 just in general demolition funds in last year's budget that didn't get spent that we'd like to carry over to this fiscal year, but they haven't really been, uh, they weren't encumbered into to anything in particular, but so it'll take a city council budget amendment to actually carry them over. And uh, that'll probably be part of this amended budget that comes up with the new budget that we, we start out this year. Hasn't been any need for them yet. So there's been no written, real need to actually amend the budget. Um, and then in addition to that, we still have uh, uh, funding set aside for the demolitions related to the battlefield properties that we've been purchasing. Um, I think we carried over about $194,000 into this fiscal year. Um, Mark had given me a list of what it looks like we have left to do, and, and that looks like that money should be sufficient to cover all of that. So uh, we also have some, some funding under the um, uh, FEMA grant that we received as well for demolitions that hasn't been spent yet as well. So all that together leaves a pretty good budget for demolitions. All right. Thank you. I, I just because when I said when it said there was none, I just thought, well, there, I know that we have some and I know there's projects that are in the work. And I just this is an update for the council and myself to uh, know that some of the projects that we have, whether they be community development projects because they're just rehabilitation and removal. But the uh, other ones are, are developmental tied to the, the grant, as you said. So I appreciate the update. Thanks. Uh, Vince, uh, there are a couple other items I just had made notes on. I know that uh, in the end it talked about not funded also, or not funded, you said alleys. We're going to look at those as we move forward. They, uh, I know we've talked about this one particular area that uh, is council is going to be uh, weighing in on here soon regarding the proposed uh, street conversions, uh, specifically Harrison and, and Cass, and that discussion will come up here the first of the year. One of the items I thought would be tied to that would be the how do we make sure we, because uh, the access and utilization of the alleys is, is pertinent to that uh, conversion and how we might have some needs there, whether it be um, minimal to start or, or significant to what, what all that entails and cost, but also, you know, safety, lighting, uh, cleaning out, things like that of, uh, of if that's something um, that we're still thinking of in relation to that, or is that, um, Again, am I talking this year versus the upcoming year? So if I may, Your Honor, uh, and I failed to mention it, uh, but we haven't, we did not put any money in uh, capital improvements using CDBG money. So we've got some ongoing programs that we fund year in and year out. And, and, and that was, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, a void in this presentation tonight, knowing full well, we'll come back with something probably somewhere in the order of 200, 250,000 more than likely to, to be uh, allocated. So uh, that would be a potential source of uh, funding uh, either directly or by re reappropriating a project that would meet the, the CDBG eligibility that's in one of the other operating or one of the other capital funds. So okay. uh, it's something I wouldn't close the door on yet. Okay. I appreciate that. I know that we, uh, as we talked through those uh, street conversions and we did last year plus, and uh, as we move forward to further discussion, there's some components I just want to make sure that we're covering. The last item I saw on, on the uh, under the um, uh, engineering line item with the uh, North Custer Road uh, crosswalk, and I know that we probably all wish it would have been elevated a little bit more. But uh, as we kind of work through that, I know it, it, it's functional. Um, I, I think that there is some uh, comments. I think uh, maybe. Uh, Councilman Feller might have some input as well. I know that Council Michelangelo sent to all of us uh, an example of that. I think it's uh, Nighthawk, or I think it was called. So I, I think safety is important. I think everybody on council recognize that and do the residents. My question is, by looking at the $100,000, that might be the cost of that one particular item. As I look through that uh, presentation that was sent, it seemed to have an ele uh, a road elevation that you couldn't see the intersection might have been one of the attributes needed for that type of a system. I would just, I'm not opposed to uh, looking at funding for this, how we do that and what we look for, I think will be the discussion council will have as we get down the road. I think safety is important. We have to have some form of additional um, uh, awareness for the drivers about the pedestrian crossing in the, in the, uh, that kind of almost like mid block the way it is there across from Veterans Park, which does get utilized. I know that uh, I've utilized the uh, the bike trail as well as the walking and across there in uh, time of day, it it's, uh, matters. So I, I 
think there's good support for funding, but it's just a matter of what it might be in the long run. Maybe that'll just ensure that there's sufficient amount if we do go with a, uh, I guess, a higher end uh, uh, system. So just might just more of a comment as we look as I look through the budget. I'll see if there's any other questions. Uh, Brian, and then I'll see if there's other council members. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, maybe more for Pat and the rest of council. Uh, more safety items as far as uh, stop signs. Have anybody seen some of the newer stop signs that have come out uh, where they're uh, solar powered and they flash as you approach? Uh, I don't know if anybody's seen those stop signs. I'm sure Pat knows what I'm talking about. Uh, some of those could be installed in certain uh, streets in the city of Monroe. I think that might be a, a good improvement for uh, vehicle safety in the city. Just a suggestion. Thanks, Brian. Other uh, comments from council, at least on the uh, uh, the administration presentation, and of course the line items on the budget kind of go with that. And then we'll get on through the uh, other presentations. Uh, Andrew, please. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, regarding the North Custer intersections, is that is the amount listed just for one intersection? Because in my mind, it would be the, at least the two. It would be at least at, at um, Cranbrook and then it, it uh, Richards. You know, and uh, Patrick will talk a little bit about it during his presentation, but uh, the thought was let's do one uh, uh, and then uh, if, that, if everybody's comfortable, we can come back the following year with, uh, with the other. Okay. I did, uh, and I, I know I've gotten some um, questions, concerns from constituents and, and non-constituents, people living outside the district, but really still in, that require, you know, the city in, 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 in my district, in my precinct within the city to access anything else. And because of the way that Frenchtown is laid out, um, uh, specifically Rough Drive and then um, the Central Park neighborhood getting out there because there's intersections there as well, but I don't feel so much that the city is responsible for them because those are parts of Frenchtown, not parts of the city. And really, there aren't uh, sidewalks on the township part of those properties anyway. But I've been contacted uh, re regarding those intersections as well. So I don't know if we feel uh, some onus to do something there or not. Um, I think that what uh, Councilman Michelangeli sent out certainly was a was an effective option, perhaps uh, on the extreme end of effective and and, and costly. Um, I think I've I've seen some what I believe are uh, effective options, perhaps of more along the lines of what Councilman Lamore is referring to, that I think would provide some safety at a more reasonable price on the, on the order of a few thousand dollars per intersection, where those high visibility stop signs that, that have lights and, uh, and, and, and power, and then you just push the button as you approach in it, and hopefully cars will stop then. Um, but it would require a, a, a transition to um, car stop when when flashing, when light flashing, which right now it's essentially yield for pedestrians, which nobody stops and pedestrians have to play Frogger. Um, that's kind of how those intersections are treated a little bit. Uh, so transitioning to something where traffic has to stop for pedestrians to cross is going to cross into the realm of, of changes in in how we approach traffic on those intersections and i don't know if the mayor's traffic committee um is has considered that or uh has had that discussion but i think it's it's going to have some effect thank you thanks councilman i think uh i think we're all kind of sitting around the same thing uh, while having the budgeted amount i think gets us moving forward but the discussion and the deep kind of dive into it and some alternatives will come as we get forward. So it's kind of my point to raise and I think you brought some uh, points as well as the uh, council no more. So I appreciate that. And, and again, it's not about the money. It's about uh, what, what can we do with that amount to, to best utilize throughout the, uh, the uh, North Custer and in that intersection seems to be uh, the, the highest use. Um, so, you know, the questions, uh, 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 Michelle. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, my question is pertaining to the police car leasing. I know we spoke about this before and just refresh mm -hmm. my memory. How long is the lease going to be and how many vehicles are we talking about the entire fleet? 
Yeah, we're probably, and we'll do a little more analysis with it. Uh, you know, we've had a pretty good success, and I was going to mention, you know, Councilman Felder had asked for a report on how the first uh, couple years have went, and we'll have that back before Council, but, you know, we're probably looking at most of the patrol vehicles. Uh, there's a replacement of four every year, and that's probably going to be the cycle in terms uh, of uh, that, and so uh, we'll get it on, a, a, you know, but in fact, I think is it later this week, Mr. Lewis, we have a meeting with, uh, or Mr. Sell uh, with uh, um, with uh, Enterprise? Next week. Next week, okay. Yeah, so we got one a planning meeting coming up here shortly. So, um, but we'll we'll have more of that as we go through the, the proposed budget. But we do think that's the direction to go uh, at this point. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we gave it a trial with the uh, DPS and we've been pretty happy with, uh, with that, so. Thank you, Vince. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, Vince, I know we have a couple more presentations, so um, I guess we'll move forward, please. Thank you. Okay, Barry. All right. All right, so presentation mode, here we go. So uh, as far as the uh, water and wastewater departments, uh, we have a total of 16 projects between both. I'll uh, go into a little detail on each one of them. Uh, Vince touched on the criteria that was used. Uh, we parallel that as well. Um, as far as funding, uh, funding is built into the rate model that we use. Um, so uh, we go after grants uh, when they're applicable and available. So I'll jump right into wastewater. Uh, the first rank project is our sanitary sewer replacement rehabilitation program. Um, it's uh, 887,000 is being requested. Um, there's six locations, just under a mile, um, five of them, East 2nd, Riverview, West 4th, Palmwood, and Lincoln are coordinated with road projects. The sixth location is our phase two, our uh, second year of our corrective action plan. Our current corrective action plan is uh, we're going to have a pre-construction meeting later this week and on the phase one, which is lining the sewers uh, in this area. This is out in Stony Point in Frenchtown Charter Township. Um, it's a 10-year program total. Phase two is uh, lining sewer laterals, uh, the leads from the house to the main. Uh, this area is obviously inundated, uh, surrounded by Lake Erie, and uh, they have a high groundwater content that uh, gives us excess inflow and infiltration that we need to address. Um, so uh, the age of these sewers are ranged from 1840 to 1979. Um, it's addressing a regulatory uh, component of our corrective action plan, and, uh, extends the service life of the, the system. Our second rank project is a per ultraviolet uh, disinfection system at the wastewater plant. Um, on the left is uh, that these are modules. Uh, there's three channels that uh, we disinfect uh, the uh, wastewater as it uh, has been after it's been treated and goes out to the lake. Um, and all the electronics and uh, components are housed in these uh, modules that are just above the water line. Uh, this is like a version 1.0. Uh, it was first installed back in 2004. Um, that's when we uh, changed from chlorine gas to uh, ultraviolet uh, disinfection. And uh, what we're proposing to do is upgrade the system and the modules and move them out of the water, near the water, and put them up uh, like on the right in the panels. Um, so this is a, uh, an upgrade, but also uh, it'll improve our uh, ability to make it more reliable. Now, these are highly intensive uh, cars maintenance. So we're constantly working on these to uh, maintain them. Our third rank project is more of a maintenance project. It's <clears throat> replacing large valves that are used for isolating and maintenance and cleaning of tanks and things. Um, there's uh, these valves on our secondary treatment side at the wastewater plant, as well as that we call it a splitter box where flows come in and get directional. Uh, they flow into different tanks. Uh, they range in age from 1935 to 1960. Uh, we're requesting 275,000 for this. Um, staff spend a lot of time maintaining these valves to keep them operational because uh, we go through a lot of cleaning down there at the plant uh, in the tanks when uh, we take them out of service on an annual basis. The fourth rank project is a similar project. It's uh, building repairs. It's tuck pointing, and soffit replacement. Uh, 
we have a lot of uh, uh, routing that is uh, falling out. So this would be a could be a coordinated project with uh, Ohio Building Restoration, uh, for example, uh, especially if we're looking at other facility improvements like that, that we can uh, address these types of concern. And up here we have some uh, soffit that we need to replace. Uh, the whole intent is to tighten up the water or the building envelope to uh, keep uh, leaks out and uh, off the equipment. Our last rank project is purchasing an additional portable generator. Uh, so when we lose power, uh, we have 36 lift stations. Um, 14 of them already have a means for maintaining flow, but 22 of them do not. There's a total of six existing generators that we use for uh, maintaining flows in the collection system to uh, transport it to the wastewater plant for treatment. Uh, this would give us an additional option to, uh, for flexibility to maintain flows in the system. Uh, the existing uh, uh, generators are between 25 and 36 years old, so they're not as reliable, but uh, you know, we, we still can get parts and whatnot to uh, keep them in service. Um, so we're proposing to replace or add a, an additional to the fleet. All right, so I'm gonna jump into water distribution. Um, there's two projects for our water distribution replacement program. These are coordinated with uh, the road projects where applicable. We're asking for 837,500. Uh, two, two locations are Riverview between Scottwood and Elm. And then on the East Second, uh, there's a portion that needs to be replaced uh, right in front of the county and the county buildings. Um, it's about 0.63 miles. Uh, the age is between 1912 and 1948. Uh, we'll replace all lead and galvanized service lines to the meter if needed. Uh, we're estimating about 67 of them uh, in these uh, two locations, uh, and it'll improve the fire flow and system reliability with these. Second rank project is uh, the Rossler Elevated Storage Tank Improvements, we're requesting a half million dollars. Uh, this was originally installed in 1948 and was raised about 40 feet in 1968 for improving system hydraulics. Um, this is a maintenance project to extend the service life of the tank. It requires an exterior overcoat of paint, um, some interior fire fall prevention. It's like a safety improvement. We'll also improve a mixer for water quality, uh, maintaining the water column that's in the tank. Uh, we'll have to do some retrofitting and there's a valve vault that's just below the tank. Uh, we have to replace all the piping and the valves in there uh, and put in some actuators. Uh, we have to also replace the electrical service line that's serving power to this tank. And most important, we'll put the new city logo on. <laughs> uh, the third break project is uh, the Ida storage tank improvements, uh, another maintenance project to maintain the service uh, life of this tank. It's a $90,000 request. It was originally installed in 2004. Uh, we have some uh, cleaning to do on the exterior and interior to prep it for an overcoat paint on both the interior and exterior and the foundation and uh, we'll replace the logo in kind. And uh, as I mentioned, there's some safety features we have to incorporate in this project. The fourth rank project is the uh, service truck replacement uh, requesting 78,000. The existing truck has about 75,000 miles um, and uh, they last between typically eight and 10 years before we start seeing a lot of uh, cost and maintenance. So I'm uh, starting to hit the maintenance, uh, high costs for replace or repairs. So we're proposing to replace it and uh, uh, obtain a more efficient vehicle for uh, providing service to our customers uh, within the large service area. Okay, so jumping over to water filtration division, um, the South Custer Booster Station upgrades phase two. This has a, been a multi-year funded project. This is the, 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 the last amount of uh, funds that we're requesting to uh, move forward with completing the projects, 382,000. Um, what we're proposing to do here is uh, add redundancy and capacity by adding a new pump uh, to this uh, station. Which it does require a building expansion. Uh, we'll also replace the backup generator and put in an automatic transfer type uh, and improve the communications. Uh, we do have to uh, purchase a small piece of property from the Monroe County Fair Board, which I've been working with Matt Buds on uh, as far as the offer. And uh, uh, we'll be also uh, moving 
I'll be back this year, a proposal for design services. Uh, this is a uh, Department of Eagle inventory requirement identified as a project that has to be required as a deficiency in uh, our 2020 sanitary survey that was just completed. So um, what, what it is, is it's a firm capacity issue. Uh, basically, we have two pumps out there and uh, you have to be able to take the largest one out of service and still meet all your capacity requirements, which we've had to run two pumps out there uh, in the last few years, uh, a lot more than we have in the past. So therefore, uh, we have to expand and add an additional pump. Okay, our second rank project is a maintenance project. It's the West Reservoir Crack Repair. Um, this is the 1987 underground reservoir that's below the tennis courts. Um, every five years, we have to take this out of service, inspect, and uh, make any repairs for cracks and whatnot uh, that are found. Um, this is, uh, again, a regulatory requirement, uh, but it's also like a maintenance project to maintain water quality and reliability. Uh, the third rank project is recoding and repeating the Spirex uh, dome that's on top of our clarifier three. Um, it has a uh, elastomeric type membrane. Um, it's, it gets UV damage and cracks. Uh, so we're trying to maintain the integrity of that um, it's a gunite type material with uh, reinforcement. And uh, this just protects it and um, you know, avoids obviously any leaks to uh, start going into our clarifiers. So that's a $30,000 request for that project. Our fourth rank project is uh, gonna be a, uh, we're proposing to be a multi-year funded project to address several things. Uh, 62,500 is being proposed to uh, re replace the main driveway going into the water plant. Uh, it's been repaired and patched and numerous times. Uh, the last uh, time it has been fully removed, or at least portions of it is uh, back in the 70s and then in the late 80s. Uh, we also found some sewer separation that needs to occur um, through doing some testing uh, here in the last few years. So uh, we'll address that at the same time. And the last project that uh, for the water filtration division is a clarifier rapid mix upgrades. Uh, each clarifier has a, what's called an inline mixer. Um, this was originally installed in the 1972 expansion project. And um, in the early 1990s, it was re removed. Uh, they were taken out of service because they leaked significantly and they were high maintenance. Um, they, we really didn't see any benefit in treatment when they were operating or they were not. Therefore, they were removed. Uh, in this last round of our Department of Eagle inspections uh, with our sanitary survey. Um, this is required to be installed as part of our, it's the 10 state standard they require it, uh, to put, put a mixer in. Uh, as we inject chemicals, you have to add energy to mix the chemical in rapidly uh, to meet that standard. So uh, they're requiring us to replace those. So uh, we're proposing to replace those with staff uh, in this funding cycle. And then going into the raw water partnership, our first rank project uh, is uh, the addition of a raw water pump. Uh, you've probably seen this in the past. Uh, we, we thought we had the funding in place and we started the design and evaluation and we found that the electrical system needs to be upgraded uh, to the point where uh, we have to request some additional funds for the next few years. So uh, this project would add an additional large pump to uh, allow us to be able to pump water to meet the plant's rated capacity, which is 18 million gallons. So uh, that's a, a first rank project. Our second rank project is uh, replacing our total or organic carbon analyzer. Um, the one on the left was originally uh, granted to us from the state of Michigan um, in 2011. It was installed and put in service in 2012. Uh, we were notified uh, by the vendor, uh, Hawk, that uh, as of October 2021, there'll be no more spare parts available. Uh, they sent and they're not supporting it, such that we have to replace that. So uh, this is part of our real-time monitoring equipment. Um, that is, and we use this uh, every time uh, with Western Basin of Lake Erie being uh, such a uh, uh, shallow depth lake. Uh, when the wind kicks up, uh, the water quality parameters change significantly so quickly uh, 
uh, it allows us time to optimize water treatment so that way we can maintain water quality and uh, cost effectively treat water. So uh, anyway, this is a definitely a necessary piece of equipment we need to replace. Um, is there any questions? That's all I had with my presentation. Thank you, Barry. I'll see if there's any uh, questions from uh, council members for uh, Brian. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I've actually got three questions. I'll try to be re really brief here, Barry. Uh, does Frenchtown have any responsibility towards the lining project that's going to be happening on Point of Pole Road? Uh, yes, actually, uh, the with the rate structure that's in place, uh, all units of government pay the same rates. So it's built into our rate model that whether you're in the city of Monroe or Frenchtown or Raisinville or Monroe Township, it's built into that rate structure. Okay, so Frenchtown, Frenchtown will take uh, some of their money and put it towards the same, you know, lining project that we're doing here, correct? Or Well, we're not adding capacity to the system. This is a corrective action plan. It's a maintenance project is what we have, what we're trying to accomplish with this. So we can uh, meet the remedial design storm. Um, our, the system has to meet this. So uh, there's no capital outlay by Frenchtown that's required. Uh, we, in our 10 year program, we'll have projects in the city and in uh, Monroe Township. So this is phase one and phase two. Well, let me, it, it, this is something that Frenchtown uses though, that line or no? Absolutely, their customers, uh, yes, when they- Okay, so, we, well, so we're billing them through the, uh, basically invoicing their customers and that's how we're getting uh, repaid for that, correct? Correct, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, uh, on the truck replacement, is, there, is that a possibility for uh, leasing a vehicle there? Absolutely, we'll look at that when we uh, get to that point for bidding. Uh, we'll uh, look at, just like we did with the vector, uh, here if you, the wastewater vector, uh, the lease option was the best option for us. We'll absolutely take a look at that. Cool, very good. And last question, is there any possibility of getting any state aid for that uh, TOC replacement? For, I'm sorry, which project? The, the TOC replacement? Yes, we sent a request in with SEMCOG. Um, there are, Kind of our host agency that has been uh, uh, working with all the different department, all the different water plants, and our uh, the state of Michigan for funding. At this point, we were told no, uh, just because it wasn't a budgeted line item. But there is other equipment in that 14 water plant real-time monitoring system that needs to be replaced. Um, but as they said, as of now, it's not funded. But uh, if it does become funded, then obviously we won't spend our funds. Okay, maybe it's something we need to ask our state reps about, which one of us can do that, I'm sure. Yeah, so. they, they replaced uh, a significant amount of money about three years ago. They replaced, uh, uh, I want to say, three to $500,000 worth of all the equipment between the 14 plants. So we did receive some replacement equipment at no cost to us, to both us, the city and French town. Okay. Thank you, sir. Looks looks like a great outlay. Appreciate it. Um, other questions from council members? Okay, I don't see any. Thank you, Barry. Uh, and um, I guess, Mr. Pastu, we have uh, another presentation. Mr. Lewis. Uh, Mr. Lewis will go through the uh, streets and other infrastructure projects that we have out there. All right. Honorable Mayor and Council, Patrick Lewis, Director of Engineering and Public Services. I'm going to make this as fast as I can. I got 29 slides. I can do 30 seconds a slide and I'll get you out of here on time. <laughs> Let me see if, I, see if I can do that. Uh, everybody see that okay? Yep. All righty. I think I can just, uh, I thought I could start the, there we go. Okay, here's a summary of mine. Uh, we've got, uh, and I've, the way we've got the projects broken down here, I've got 16 projects, although you'll see 17 on there, and I'll explain why when we get to it. Uh, I've kind of broke those down, and I can, I can email this out to everybody. I won't read it verbatim here, but I kind of broke down how we're bidding that, um, how we're packaging the streets for this year. For example, I've got uh, three requests for the 2021 concrete paving program, and that'll be over a little over $2 million. Seven requests for what'll be the asphalt resurfacing piece of that, a little shy of $2 million. Um, three streets on the microsurfacing contract through the federal uh, federal aid process, 
and then a couple of future things. And of course, the aforementioned North Custer crosswalk improvements, $100,000. And yes, that's intended to be uh, still kind of fluid as far as what that project or projects will be. So uh, we put a placeholder amount in there. It's possible it could be higher. It's possible we could settle on a number of lower, lower tiered uh, uh, improvements there. And then we have uh, six infrastructure projects around a million and a half. Uh, and I'll get to those when we come to it. Uh, we talked about the streets criteria and we've, we've done that before. Every year we drive the streets block by block, rate them, combine them for longer segments and uh, take into account the usual stuff. I won't belabor that, but I can, I'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, when we get to the end here, I do have uh, this year's program is a little over five miles, which includes about three miles of reconstruction resurfacing and then a little over two miles of that microsurfacing uh, between those projects. Uh, this is the first year we'll have the 15, uh, 15 year two mill levy available. As, as you've all been on council before, you've all heard this, uh, the way we do the, handle the streets, rate the driving surface uh, from zero, which is perfect, to 10, which is impassable, and we don't have any of those other than Spalding Road, which doesn't really exist. Um, curbs from a zero to, a, to uh, with new and four to none, and then we give an additional street for major streets or base failure. Uh, combine those blocks, like we said. Uh, possible points, zero to 16, and we usually start to look at these when they're seven or eight, because as you might figure, uh, to get to 16 means a completely impassable street with no curbs. So we don't let them get that bad before we start dealing with them. Um, as I mentioned before, we don't always do uh, worst first because there's a lot of other considerations. Uh, sometimes we'll see concrete versus asphalt. We'll try to group those packages year by year. Um, sometimes Barry has more needs than we do. Sometimes we have more needs than he does, but we try not to outrun each other. So a lot of times, like you'll see the theme of this year's program is that we have more money than he does because of the street millage. So we've got a number of streets that don't have utility projects on them that we can get out on the street quickly. Um, so I won't go too, too deep into those. I'll just start blowing through the projects here as quickly as we can. Um, the first two projects are microsurfacing jobs. And I've mentioned this before, um, they're fairly easy to program through the federal aid system. Uh, even though it's technically a preventative maintenance item and we wouldn't consider it capital improvements, the feds actually do consider this to be eligible. So um, we picked two long segments that actually are, are uh, right next to each other of streets that were done in the last eight to 10 years. And that would be uh, East Elm Avenue, which is now 10 years old um, from Monroe to Dixie. And then the second project, which I'll put on here is, uh, whoops, I think I kept the same title block there. That's intended to be North Dixie Highway from Elm to Spalding Road, sorry about that. Um, and that just lists the funding we've got set aside for that. Uh, Dixie Highway was done in 2013. And both of these are, we consider excellent candidates for preventative maintenance work. We'll have, I'll say these will be about one or two days of extremely challenging construction because we're gonna have to keep traffic off of these while they cure. Um, but other than that, it's, a, it's mostly a one or two day job. So um, we will probably do these projects later in the year because I'm trying to get out our, our big uh, uh, concrete and asphalt programs. And we have a little more time to deal with these. Um, starting with project number three and moving moving on down, um, I won't belabor these too much. They've got pictures that show um, usually the poorest part of the street. That's why I listed it. Um, Riverview Avenue resurfacing Elm to Scottwood. This is a, a three inch mill and resurfacing and we're gonna do almost all the curbs. Um, you'll see a theme here. Most of these are at least 20 years old. This is the one of the newer ones, if you will, but, um, and this will be coordinated with an eight inch water main replacement. So uh, this will be a pretty heavy investment between those two projects. So we're, we're looking at um, somewhere north of a million and a half between the water and resurfacing programs going together on this one. So uh, this will be our, our longest street from the year, but it's, uh, it's fairly major because it's the one neighborhood street that goes through. So that will be a coordinated project with water mains, as will number four, which is Northwest Noble Avenue resurfacing Godfrey Monroe. This one's just a mill and fill. Uh, we're keeping the curbs on this one. You can see actually a little bit of a bite on one of the curbs. Um, so we'll probably do some surgical replacement there. Uh, this is almost 40 years old now. And this also will be coordinated with water main. And this will kind of uh, end the program in that area. We've done uh, both Borges and Godfrey water main and resurfacing projects in the last couple of years. So. Uh, number five, six, and seven are all downtown. They're all kind of tied together because they, they abut each other. Uh, five being Washington Street from third to first, and that is just a, a, a spot curb and driver placement mill and fill on this one. Uh, these were all done in 1986 last, so you're looking at 35-year-old uh, streets. And with all of these asphalt resurfacing, we're, we're combining them into one contract that will be bid in mid-March. 
and that will include the uh, the few the three water mains that we've got, as well as all the resurfacing. And if there's time, I'll explain uh, some of our thinking on that one. Uh, East Second Street. We're just going to do one block between Washington and Macomb. Uh, there is about 180 feet of water main to do on this one, which is a pretty straightforward job. And the rest of it will just be a, a milling and resurfacing. And we're leaving most of the curbs in place. Um, South Macomb Street. This one, uh, those of you that come into City Hall quite a bit probably see that I'm pretty familiar with this one. Uh, I remember when I first started with the city almost 23 years ago, it was starting to look kind of cracked up then a little bit. Um, so here we are ready to resurface this one. So this will be most of the curb replacement. We're going to probably keep one of the, the east side curbs between first and second because those were done in 1986. Most of the rest of it will probably replace. Um, projects number eight and nine coming up are going to be conversions. And uh, those are they're currently asphalt streets that require curb and gutter. And we did an analysis as we were programming these to look at does it make more sense to change these over to concrete streets or leave them as asphalt resurfacing streets? And um, generally where the base, like you'll see this on 4th and you'll see this on Sackett, which is the next one coming up. The concrete base is really old on both of these. And there's not a lot of asphalt on the surface. And so what we expect to find is if we start milling this off, we're gonna have a base that's in pretty poor shape. So um, in a lot of cases, the asphalt's the glue that's holding that poor base together. And we did an analysis on these streets and, and fourth is only 24 feet wide and Sackett's only 18. The narrower the street is, the more cost effective it is to go to concrete because we're already pulling the curbs out in either case. So um, both of these look like they were within uh, 20 to 30 percent. Uh, and there's some variability based on what our bid pricing lined up. But if you, if you think about an asphalt street is conventionally is figured to have a 15 year lifespan, usually with preventative maintenance, you can get 20 or even 25. Concrete streets are more like 30 and in a lot of cases, 40. So you're looking at roughly double the lifespan for 20 to 30% of the cost um, increase going to concrete. So we are looking at that on 4th Street. And there's two different segments of this, Union to Hubble and then Harrison to Monroe. We did actually do the block between Hubble and Harrison in 2014 when we did a sanitary sewer project. So certainly we're not doing that again, but then it, then it will, the rest of the street will actually match the, uh, match the middle part of it in that it'll, it'll be a concrete conversion. Um, project number nine, nine is also, is Sackett. That's also the same thing. Sackett's an almost no brainer converting to concrete because it's only 18 feet wide. And by the time we take the curbs out and prep it for the gutter pan, you can't park on the street anyway. And there's only room for one car to get down there. So uh, construction wise, this will be very straightforward to do. As you can see, the concrete base is, is nearly 100 years old as well. Um, project 10 was one we actually looked at doing a concrete conversion on, but it is, is a wider street. It's 28 feet wide and the numbers game was more like 35 to 40 percent on this one. So we are going to do a curb replacement and a three inch mill and fill. Uh, it was resurfaced in 1964. Uh, the other part of the reason we're not going with a concrete conversion is it's a dead end street. We don't know where everybody's going to park. Um, during construction on an asphalt roadway, we can actually keep uh, one-sided parking live and we can do the curbs half at a time. So that was another consideration that went into uh, this was a traffic maintenance. So Palmwood is one of those. And I know, I, I think it was Councilman Nicolangeli that raised some concerns about our, our rating factor taking into account traffic and things like that. We actually don't take traffic directly into account um, in this, but he is correct from the standpoint of some of these uh, lower volume roads have a difficult time making the top of the list. So we did want to throw a couple of those in this year's program because their condition certainly would justify it. And we did a water main project over here a number of years ago. Um, so we're, it's, it's due now for the resurfacing piece. Uh, project 11 is one where we actually did a spot milling. Um, I'm going to think of the year is probably 2012 or 13, where we did half of Half of, half of the length. So we did one half of the roadway, half the length um, because it had gotten so bad. But this was one we resurfaced in 96, we did all the curbs then and, and actually widened it a little bit for the, because Christensy was still open at the time. Um, this is one we don't have to do any curb. So it's a relatively uh, minor expense. It'll just be a, a mill and fill an easy one to add to the pile. So this one's already designed. Now we're getting into a little more of the uh, projects that are, that are, I'll say either speculative or future years. Uh, Priority number 12 is what we believe to be our federal aid project for next year, 2022. And the reason we originally were going to look at the section of Riverview from Elm to Scottwood as a federal project until we realized it didn't meet the lane widths. It was only 26 feet wide, and we certainly didn't want to start 
pulling curbs and taking down trees just to widen it to meet the federal standards. So um, we switch gears and actually going north from Maywood to Oakwood is in a little bit better shape, but not much better. Um, and we are going on 20 years now on this one. This one does meet federal lane width standards. We already have this surveyed from when we did a water project 10 years ago. And so we're asking for design funding so we can get this in the queue and bid it hopefully late in the year for uh, 2022 construction. And typically I'll do this every year with my street program. I'll ask for funding for the next, next year's federal job. Okay, 13 is actually three different street projects, but we put it as one request because we want them all to go together. This is the one where we're looking at um, using the, the Michigan Transportation Fund bonds to pull the money ahead. And um, we, did show, we did actually set aside some funding before for this in anticipation of hopefully getting a grant project but we've got about a little over a million and a quarter that we need to set aside for this year. This will be a full reconstruction, nine inches on a six inch stone base. We figured the cost to do the stone base, but we found in many cases, the base from before is in good shape. So we expect to not need all this money as long as everything is, is good underneath the pavement. Um, everything's over in, 30, over in 30 years, and this would be sections of Rose, Telb, and Turnus. Um, the sections of Rose and Telb would be east of Detroit Avenue. Um, and then we'll be looking at the west side of Detroit Avenue in a future year. One thing I did want to point out that we have Telb listed on originally from Detroit to Turnus and the city manager and I actually looked and scoped that and we're going to reduce the westernmost 600 feet. So that gives us a couple of hundred thousand dollars to play with and I'll get to that in just a minute how we intend to use that. Um, I don't know how much time Vince wants me to spend on this one. Um, maybe we can come back to this if there's any you questions. You can blow it up just a little bit. Uh, okay. and, uh, All yours. Yeah. You know, part of it is it just, uh, and I'm not sure if it's easy to follow or not, but you can see that uh, we did uh, a bond issue with the uh, uh, Michigan Transportation Fund uh, in 2016 uh, when the state indicated they were going to start increasing the funding to uh, Act 51 for our, and, and so what we're planning on doing is uh, using what was previously appropriated, that 440000 and then if you look out in years uh, uh, 20, uh, 526, I believe, and 27, uh, then, then we would be uh, adding those on to uh, uh, out there and the incurring essentially interest costs. And you can see how low the interest rates are. And this was prepared by our, uh, our uh, uh, financial advisor, uh, PFM, uh, with that. And so we're looking just to stack the existing uh, 2016 bond and then put this in there in place uh, for those out years so that we, get, again, as Patrick said, get a favorable bond uh, um, rating, if you will, uh, for, uh, um, I shouldn't say bond rating, but a favorable uh, uh, construction bids with a, a large concrete uh, a bid package. The other thing with it is keep in mind, if, when you look at those interest rates, the, the, co the estimated cost of construction is, is far greater than that, almost double, even triple uh, what's anticipated in the future. So there is some financial sense in making uh, this, uh, this decision here. So uh, that's why we're going to recommend financing it. I couldn't justify putting it through the, uh, the, the millage, which we thought would be more for residential streets, but certainly using this uh, funding, I think would be appropriate. Yep. And, and as the city manager likes to say, I've been, I've been on his case about these streets. For a number of years, so <laughs> It's not just mollifying me. It will, it will be mollifying the industries that have been uh, in turn reminding me not to forget them as well. So uh, Yep. It's, it's really needed. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, I'm glad we were able to do that. And yes, I believe you'll get good bids on this because it's, it's a very good location and they can sort of blow and go. It's right off the expressway. It's real near one of our concrete suppliers. So there shouldn't be any reason we don't get favorable bids on this. So, all right, continuing on with the streets program, I always ask this particular year, I'm going to ask for um, uh, roughly a hundred thousand dollars to set aside for um topographic survey work for, for next year's projects. We haven't yet identified all of them. We, we know what we think most of them are, but we may end up with some more. And um, because you're setting aside $5 million for this year's construction, I can tell you at 15% contingency, that's a lot of money. If everything goes well, we're going to have the ability to, to have a couple or three more projects that could potentially hit late season. So uh, we want to identify those, get those in the hands of a consulting firm and get those surveyed uh, very quickly. So uh, I'm going to ask for money set aside for that this year. Um, project number 15 is, I will say it's a little bit of a contingent project. I don't want to say speculative. The, the tap dance I do every year with our federal funds is that um, 
we can't roll them over to a future year. So if we don't use them, we can't use them next year. So we want to try to get as close to our federal allocation as we can. Uh, sort of like the price is right. We want to get as close as we can without going over. Um, we, when we really started detailing the two microsurface jobs on Elm and Dixie, I'm not sure we're going to spend all of our federal aid. So we looked at the next logical project that was on a federally eligible roadway and said, okay, is there another one we can do fairly easily? And that we identified North Macomb Street, which is on the 2026 list for resurfacing. But we think that if we microsurface it, we might even be able to push that down a few more years. So if this project doesn't happen, it will be because either we had problems getting it programmed through the feds or that we used all the money on Elm and Dixie and we just chose not to, not to expend it on, on Macomb. But I'm asking for funding just to let you know it's there so you can approve the project and, and give you more intention of what we're, what we're looking to do. I think we'll be able to squeeze it in there, but I, I may not know that for a couple more months. So just to let you know where we are in this one. Patrick, um, I think uh, Council yes. Member Felder had a question. Okay, sorry, I can't see everybody's screen. What's that, Andrew? Yes, sir. Uh, as we talk about streets in front of the hospital, I know that, um, well, they were, they've were they been planning to move here for a little bit, and they seem to have dragged their feet a little bit on that. And we've uh, somewhat delayed our projects in that area in anticipation of that move so that we wouldn't have to tear streets up twice. Um, at what point do we just cross a line where streets that are so near that area like Grove just need to get done because it's time like we can't wait anymore. Are we nearing that or do we still have a couple of years grace before we get to that point? Do uh, we just tip over the edge? Yeah, that's a really good question, Councilman, because that was, Grove is one of them. When I read what the what the hospital said about pushing out now till 2025, I said, doggone it, how many years am I going to keep pushing Grove off? And <laughs> you're exactly right. Grove is the one that we had looked at saying, we just didn't want to deal with it because we didn't know if there were going to be, you know, we didn't know what kind of trucks you're going to have moving all the equipment out of there and things like that. And we didn't want to beat up a new street, but I, I think you're right. I think th those residents don't deserve to wait another five years to get their street done. I would Grove is one where we could easily, easily push that as to potentially a late season project this year, if we chose to with monies that we might have left over if the bids are favorable. So uh, that will be one that we will likely survey to have ready to go. Okay, so you're saying we're there. Well, I, I think we're there. I, five years is too long to continue waiting. And, and, and realistically, if we, if we construct that road, um, at, you know, we've been constructing our roads with eight inch concrete. And if we've got a decent base under that, I'm not overly worried about trucks beating it up, you know, coming out that drive. It's more of a geometrics question of if we ended up with redevelopment of the site, does that serve as a major street into an office park or does that become a residential street that forms part of a loop and that we have to tear out the easternmost hundred feet to put a curve in there or something like that. That's more what I was worried about than anything else. But clearly if the hospital doesn't plan on building for five years and then the redevelopment takes five years, you're gonna be part, a long way down the life cycle of road before we're even talking about changes. So I think we're there. Okay. Thank you, sir. You're very welcome. Thanks for the question. Great one. Hey, Patrick. Okay, keep moving. Good question. I like the I talk discussion on, on Grove. Thank you. Um, you want me, Councilman Lamore has his hand up. You want me to keep moving or? Ryan? Yeah, real quickly. Uh, just, I, I hate to backtrack a little bit, but since we've, we're asking questions now regarding the Turnus project, uh, are we going to beef that up a little bit? Or are we just replacing? Because, you know, that's going to take more traffic now uh, in the future than it was in the past. If you understand the, my question. Yeah, yeah. The, the, actually, the, the existing standard is eight inch concrete on a six inch stone base. We are beefing that up about an inch. I mean, and there's no magic to this. Some of it's without getting too deep in the weeds here as far as pavement design. We don't typically use reinforced concrete for a number of reasons. Um, that would be the only way we'd beef it up more, um, but that's that adds a, an entirely different element of cost. I will say that the roads themselves have held up as expected because these were all built in the mid to late '80s. So you're talking about you're talking about more than a 30 year lifespan on some pretty heavy industrial roads. So um, we are to some degree, and we we've put in money to to replace the stone base if need. Be but we found on other sections that the, the stone base was in really, really good shape. So um, we're gonna, we'll save the money and, and, and do without replacing that. So far, so good on the sections that we've replaced with our slightly uh, thicker cross section 
uh, four or five years ago. That was the, those are the end pieces, the one by Dixie and then south by Telb along Turnus. Those have already been replaced and we've, we've had no, no failures, no cracks um, of any significance. So we're, I think we're in pretty good shape. Um, Mayor, I don't know. I think we're getting close. So I, I think Vince said that we might have to spill me over into the regular meeting. I don't, there's no way I can finish. So, Right. So um, I'll, I'll just look to Vince there. I, I think we've got a few more road projects before we get into the infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, we only have about five, four minutes, so we should really probably move forward. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up because obviously I've got to come back to the infrastructure. I can finish the last two streets projects if you want to give me more time after the regular meeting. Or yeah, the, yeah, we'll have we'll have time at the at the meeting, I think. Okay. Yep. Clerk Treasurer, sound good? Sure. Yeah. I know we have uh, there's a few more items on on Mr. Lewis's presentation. I think we can pick it up and finish it at the uh, as we get in before uh, comments at the end of the meeting. We'll have to. I don't know if we need an amendment as much as a presentation or discussion there. We can, um, I, I guess I would defer to, to Mr. Buds, but I, I would just, we could just add a presentation. And, okay, right at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That works. That's probably sufficient. We're not Buds. making any decisions. He's just nope. presenting. Yeah. Okay, I like that. So as we get in, uh, as we conclude here quickly on our work session, because we only have about three minutes, we'll just need uh, moving in toward the uh, council meeting to uh, make a motion from a council person support to amend the agenda asked to uh, presentation to finish the capital improvements uh, um, uh, project presentation. Yeah. Very good. Vince, any last comment before we go or are you going to want to just save it nope. for the- nope. I'm fine, Your Honor. All right. Um, I guess we'll save our questions then too, just so we can get uh, set for uh, set for our meeting. So, uh, thank you for the presentation. I'll have some comments on it, uh, all of it collectively later. Uh, uh, great presentations to all. Thank you for those that may be staying. And at this time, we'll close the uh, work session, and uh, we'll get ready here in a couple minutes. Thanks. And the YouTube uh, broadcast continues. Thank you.
I think we have, oh, there we go. I think, I know Mr. Pastu will be joining us. So we'll give him a hearing and we'll get started. Court Treasurer, are we uh, ready? We're ready. I believe so as well. It is 731. This time we'll call the City Council meeting to order. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilperson Whitman. Present. Location, please. City of Monroe. Uh, Ike Angeli. He's excused. Signing. Here, City of Monroe. Your meaning. Here, City of Monroe. Lamore. Present, City of Monroe. Felder. Present, City of Monroe. Mayor Clark. Present, City of Monroe. And uh, Clerk Treasurer. Uh, Clerk Treasurer, City of Monroe. Very well. I, we have um, uh, next item, please. The next item is the invocation and pledge. We are grateful for the great resources of our community and for the freedom which has been its heritage. Inspire us to serve with fairness, humility, and integrity, and to work for the welfare of this community and all who call it home or do business here. We ask for guidance and direction as we come together. Thank you. And if you would all please join uh, in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America, America. To the Republic of the United States. One nation, one nation, under God, under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice. Thank you. Uh, clerk, next item, please. The next item are any amendments to the agenda? Well, uh, we came out of a work session uh, that uh, was uh, a lot of good information. So I know that we're looking to make an amendment to uh, continue some uh, work session. Councilman Lamore? Muted, sir. You're, you're muted, uh, Councilman. Sorry, Your Honor, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to amend the agenda to allow for the extended presentation by the Department of Public Services Director. On the Capital Improvements Program, correct? On the Capital Improvements Program, yes, thank you, the CIP. Second. Motion by Councilman Lamore, supported by Councilman Felder to amend the agenda to add the uh, uh, completion of the uh, work session presentation on the CIP. Clerk, please call the roll. Um, Your Honor, we didn't uh, discuss this, but I would assume we'll just go ahead and insert that after citizen comments. Uh, yes, we can do that. Okay. Yes, thank you. That should have been added. Uh, Councilman uh, Lamore, that worked? Agreed. Yes, we'll add that after the citizen's comments, please. Uh, Councilman Felder? That's acceptable. Thank you. Thank you, Clerk. You're welcome. Uh, Councilperson Whitman? Yes. Vining? Yes. Germaney? Yes. Lamore? Yes. Felder? Yes. Mayor Clark? Yes. Next item, please. The next item are citizen comments not related to an agenda item. Okay. And I see no hands raised, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. At this time, if there's any uh, comments from those present uh, uh, attendees, uh, if you wish to speak, raffle the uh, rules of the chamber for three minutes, but also uh, state your name and uh, jurisdiction of residence. And if we don't have any, we'll have an opportunity at the end of the meeting as well for citizens' comments. Are there any comments at this time from those that are uh, present? I still see no comments, Your Honor. I see no hands raised. Okay, we'll move forward. Uh, clerk, next item, please. The next item was the amended agenda item, a, a continuation of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pastu, I don't know if there's any comments, and I know Mr. Well, uh, I think uh, if we get uh, Mr. Lewis to get back on the shared screen, we'll wrap that up. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Lewis. All right. Everybody see that again? Yes. Yes. All righty. Well, we'll, we'll uh, let me see if I can get it rolling here. There we go. All right, so where we left off was Streets 15, North Macomb Street, and that was be the microsurfacing job. And as 
I was answering a question relative to uh, when we're looking at the streets around the hospital and uh, we wouldn't be doing North Macomb this year. Uh, that's not quite bad enough for resurfacing, but we did talk about Grove Street. So uh, that would be one where we could consider doing that in 2022 or even this year if we were really lucky. So um, if I on. might add too, Patrick, I just I don't want to lose the, the point to this. Uh, even though it's a federal aid project, uh, the fact that uh, now we have this millage to work with, and as Patrick mentioned, it was programmed uh, for, I believe, 2026 for resurfacing. But by doing these micro surfacing, we can extend the life of the pavement a, a lot more. And so you know, I don't want to lose sight of not only just the, the value of addressing, you know, streets are in poor condition, but now we have got resources to do, you know, what we think are, are really good uh, preventive maintenance programs to extend the life of these uh, roads. Yep. That's, I appreciate you slowing me down so we could point that out because that, that is a 100% correct statement. And that's why we wanted to select this year to, to do some of those because uh, we don't have a lot of experience with urban microsurfacing jobs. And we want to we want to add as many arsenal or anything tools to our arsenal as we possibly can. So, OK, so now we're down to the last couple of projects. Uh, Street 16 was the North Custer Road crosswalk improvements. This was, uh, as I mentioned in here and kind of in the scoping documents, we were a little bit cagey on exactly what we ended up with, mostly because I'm not 100 percent sure what we're going to end up with. Um, I called this review of additional enhancements up to and including Hawk signal. Now that doesn't mean that it's just one location or multiple locations, but um, one of the things that I know the police department and I will need to um, look at the corridor holistically, because I think what we don't wanna do is throw up uh, flash and crosswalk signs at every intersection. And you look at an intersection like the one we've got here at Cranbrook, we've got crosswalks on both sides of that intersection. How do we signalize that? Do we signalize one crosswalk versus the other? Um, what about, tra are you having traffic in each direction stop on the far side of the intersection, which leaves the intersection completely open? These are a lot of things we need to evaluate, and review, and look at. Um, I've seen these in other locations. I think the closest hawk signal that I'm aware of is they do have one by the Brown Brownstown Township Hall on King Road. Um, and that's, but that's, that's a different type of application because uh, if, you, if you see the way that one's set up, that's the only crosswalk for half a mile in either direction. What we have here is a number of potential pedestrian crossing points. And so what we want to be careful is, is to not put so much sign, sign and signal clutter that people are losing sight of the message. And that may even mean, um, dare I say, take out a few of these crosswalk locations to try to force people to cross where we want them to. If we're going to give them an added sense of protection, we want to try to, um, you know, minimize the number of places they can cross. And so uh, we've got a lot more work to do on scoping this and where we want to go with it. Um, but I am in favor generally of the incrementalist approach. I think we continue to try building up, uh, you know, more cost effective improvements first. And if that's the push button uh, lit up perimeter signs, uh, we try that, see how that works because full blown signal installation is a fairly expensive proposition. So we want to make sure that that's absolutely necessary and that would be the most effective before we go there. So uh, I probably spent more time on this slide than any of the rest of them, but that's, um, that's where we're at right now with this. So th this is not, I don't want to say it's not an early season priority, but it, it's not because it won't be as dependent on getting favorable bid prices. We really want to hit the ground running early this year um, because I feel like when, if we get past the pandemic, we're going to end up with a glut of work that kind we may have a tougher time getting contractors. So I want to get out early with our, with our, I'll say nuts and bolts program. And we'll, we'll take the summer to, to review this and look at this and try to get something maybe later in the season. So all right, I think I'll leave it there for now in case there might be questions at the end. Um, the other project we threw in here, as I mentioned earlier, this, this does not appear on your spreadsheet, but uh, the city manager and I discussed this last week. I mentioned that we looked at Telb Street, and even though we originally had it estimated from Detroit Avenue to Turnus Drive, we looked at the section from that railroad spur line towards Detroit. We've done that 20 years ago. Um, we did a, a, a sort of a partial replacement program. And I had included it in the estimate because, frankly, I thought it was going to be at least another five years before we were able to do the project. Um, since it's now upon us, I decided, you know, the city manager and I decided we would be better served pulling that out of the scope, doing that in a future year with uh, the westerly section of Tel, which gave us $200,000 to work with. So we looked at our list and said, what is a nice little project we could make some difference in the, uh, in the neighborhood on? And 
we're trying to work our way through Riverside Manor. And this is one where the east end of this connects with Noble, which was re reconstructed in 2012. And this would give us uh, another route through the neighborhood. So this is not surveyed. We're going to try to hurry up to get this surveyed and uh, potentially add this to the concrete paving program as sort of a late add-on. So I, I guess I'll say this is a, a project without a project number or project name. Um, but we are going to use this. This would not require additional funds. We're just going to reappropriate 200,000 from TEL. So mechanically, how we want to show that on the spreadsheet, uh, it doesn't matter to me. So I believe that is the end of our street program. So uh, I move on to, and we generally classify, and engineering submits two different groups of projects. One is streets, um, because those are generally all funded from one or you know, the major local street fund sources. And then we go with other infrastructure, which has a variety of other sources. Um, so our, our number one infrastructure project, and this is not necessarily priority order for everybody. This I always put this number one because I think we should continually have an annual sidewalk program, but that would be our 2021 sidewalk replacement program. And um, I think I originally put down 400,000 on this. Uh, we knocked it down to 300,000. With sidewalk program, you can flex size the area based on how much money you have. So uh, that's not a material cut. It just may mean we have to shift the uh, boundary line a little bit farther west than we had. So we originally in 2018, when we were going to do a program, uh, when we we're looking at 2019's project area, we were looking at going from the W streets to Smith. Um, we delayed that in 19. We delayed it again in 2020. Um, and that was largely a cost savings measure because we weren't sure where the pandemic was going to leave us funding wise. So we'd be looking at the same project area, although I thought with the larger amount of money, we might be able to make it as far east as Scott. So uh, what we do every year with this is we proactively mark um, anything with one inch or greater vertical separation or that has general deterioration more than just a single crack. Um, I gave you a picture of some that we actually already fixed. Um, we, got a we got a complaint from a uh, disabled gentleman about sidewalks on West 7th Street, which ironically is one of those streets that was, would have been done had we proceeded with a program either of the last two years. Um, so we, we had quite a few of them all on one street. So we, we uh, had some money left over in the street program and uh, added about $10,000 worth of sidewalks. And so these are actually already fixed, the ones that are in this picture. But um, that gives you an idea that lip is something that we'd be, uh, we'd be targeting for replacement. So um, our second priority project, and I've got a couple slides on this one. This is sort of the biggie for 2022. Um, and, and I know it feels like we keep pushing this project off, but some of that's because it's, it's such a large scale project. And um, in particular, the front part of 2021, we're gonna be, we're gonna be busy as all get out. Um, we are working with Spicer Group to finalize the design on this. I'd like to get them in front of you for a work session here in the next couple of meetings. Um, so we can discuss a little more in detail what their findings are. Um, we've already allocated $900,000. We believe, the city manager and I believe that that will be more than adequate to get all the design work done and get the first phases of implementation started on this one. We're probably gravitating towards a stormwater pump station because quite frankly, we just can't get the depth that we need on the storm sewers. It's the, the, the ground roll, uh, Sheet flows away from Mason Run Drain, but the water is supposed to flow to Mason Run Drain. So you get some areas where you've only got four feet between the ground surface and the, and the drain. So we just, we just can't get the, the depth we need to keep the pipes underground. So um, we are, look, we've got on the 2022 streets list, which I think I highlighted for you back in December, five different roadways in this area that are all in pretty poor condition. So um, we'd be looking to do those streets as whether it's a second phase of the project or probably part of the phase where we put on all the branch lines, but that'll be all that will be a 2022 project. We're, we'd like to get started on some of the trunk elements of this, like the mainline storm replacements in 2021 in the fall. Um, so that's, that's what we're looking at. One other, one other thing that we wanted to mention is that this would include ultimately now it may not be on the 2021 or 2022 portion of the project but disconnection of all the clear water drains through waste through a separate program with wastewater and that's it might be partially funded through wastewater but that will be eliminating your sump pumps your roof leaders and your perimeter tiles and that's going to involve going house to house so um, that's going to take a little bit longer to complete obviously we can't do that until we have a place for them to put their storm water which is why the uh, the storm sewer project has to go first, but it will be that will be done as a part of this uh, comprehensive project. 
And if I might add, that's also an area that's identified uh, for the uh, sanitary sewer uh, corrective action plan uh, as well. So it does tie in with that. Yep, we'll get a big bang for the buck when we take the uh, clear water discharge out of this area for sure. Um, so here's here's just a timeline slide, and this get the, the map there gives you the uh, the area in question. I know you can't read the streets very well, but the northernmost road there is Cole Cole Stewart Road, um, actually Stewart there, and then you can see Mason Run drains kind of the northerly boundary of that blue line, and then everything going south to Hendricks. Um, so as I mentioned, we got project design 2021. If we're lucky, we'll get some trunk elements in place maybe over next winter, uh, late next fall. Storm and roadway construction in 2022. We will need additional funding for that, but we are looking at that being a potential uh, bond issue uh, in conjunction with some of those streets. So Vince could probably elaborate more on that when we get closer, but um, even though we might embark upon some of that construction work during the 2021-22 fiscal year, um, a portion of that won't occur until after July 1st of 2022. So it's gonna be kind of a mixed bag of how the funding all, all fits in here. But we feel like we're gonna need somewhere between one and a half and 2 million, although we, we don't have the design completed. And we've got estimated over $2 million in street work, which can be funded from the, the millage and it will include those local streets. So that's kind of the biggie for next year coming up. Um, moving on. Well, as you know, Patrick said yeah. just, uh, you know, when we get a better handle on uh, the alternatives with the storm water and getting uh, Spicer in front of uh, council to talk about it, uh, you know, we will work uh, the financing alternatives. But as he had mentioned, uh, it's uh, it is a project that uh, it's going to require some uh, additional long term financing. And I will tell you, I'm not uncomfortable with it, uh, with the financing in part because uh, the storm uh, sewer line is certainly going to have a, uh, a very lengthy uh, um, life uh, far exceeding whatever term of the bonds that we would have. So, but it really is necessary to address the, the multitude of problems up in that, that area there. Yep. Okay, our, uh, the, the next few projects here are uh, a lot less weighty than those. Um, project number three, and it was sort of alluded to earlier in Mr. Pastu's part of the presentation um, that we, our capital investments are, 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 I say our capital project requests are dropping here because every all of our light duty are now in the enterprise program. So we're no longer requesting funds for those. The patrol vehicles were the last, I'll say light duty or non-heavy equipment ones that, are, that were not in the enterprise program. We're anticipating that they will be in the enterprise program this year. Um, we, we called out that we were gonna buy four patrol cars and one detective vehicle. Um, the original request was 260,000, but we, think those will come back out as, as leases instead. So those don't need to be shown as capital projects. We do still have some capital replacement in there. We've got a brush chipper that we've got uh, called out and the patrol vehicle equipment will still be paid for out of this out of this fund directly in cash because that's something that enterprise doesn't do. They don't uh, outfit the, the lights, the cages and all that stuff. Um, and that's, that's more extensive than you might expect. And that's when we talked earlier about um, I, I didn't talk about it, but we started talking about the, the rotation of the police fleet. I don't, think the, I don't think the term will change from what we're doing now. We're generally replacing them every four years because um, there's 15 or 16 patrol units. Um, so doing four a year, we try to catch them before they get to 100,000 miles. And it's just kind of a, it's a combination of a psychological barrier there and a, a liability um, issue there. We don't like to get them so high mileage in case they're involved in a pursuit. Um, but we don't really, while we could probably save a little bit of money, there's, there's also the cost if we were to go to a more frequent, um, the challenge would be if we were, went to a two year cycle, for example, um, we'd be having to have our mechanics or somebody retrofit eight cars a year. And, and that's pretty, it's a pretty time consuming process. So we probably won't increase our frequency too much, but we will take advantage of enterprises. Um, I'll say resale market. That's, that's one of the big things that they can help us out with. Um, and, and just having, having the whole thing put on our, our system makes a lot of sense there. So, um, Mayor, I see Councilman Lamore has his hand raised, so I'll pause there for any questions. Hey, Councilman Lamore. Yep, thank you. Um, real quickly, on the patrol cars, is it possible to use some of that uh, current equipment that we have in the vehicles to put into the new leased vehicles? That it really depends. Um, I, I will say up until now, it's been difficult to do that. Um, it, it seems like, I don't want to make this blanket statement because I'll make the statement and then next year's models, they'll decide they're going to be compatible. But it, 
it all and some of that we could the, the light bars and things like that might be able to be reused the cages always seem to not quite fit because they always change one or two dimensions just enough that you need to buy new equipment and i don't want to accuse that of being a racket but um i think there's always a little bit of pressure to pressure to change something up with the new model year so it looks like a new vehicle and um certainly if we can we will um but a lot of times it's it's square peg and round hole um so so we, we do we do the best we can but usually we find that's not the case from model year to model year certainly not if the older ones are coming off you're not talking about one model year to the next you're talking about three or four years back to the next so good excellent question but i usually it doesn't work out that way for us appreciate it thank you sure okay um so I mentioned in there that we have other future year heavy equipment needs, and I, I won't get into too much to that tonight. Um, we're, we're in pretty good shape for right now. We, our, our next needs are going to be our, uh, our Ford Sterling dump trucks that are our primary salt vehicles. Those are all 2001s. We've kept them in really good shape, and we are um, replacing our two tandem axle dump trucks with a tandem and a single axle coming through the swap loader, which you, uh, the council already approved of that but we've got a pretty long lead time. So we don't expect to get those for several more months. But down the road over a three to five year period, we're gonna probably need to replace all of those. So you'll see bigger numbers for me in years to come. So um, project number four, this was one that we, I contemplated putting the numbers right in the street program, but I thought it made more sense to do a separate line item allocation for this in that we could roll those funds over from year to year if we didn't use those. Um, and we did talk, we've talked a lot about in the last year about looking at our streets holistically and on planting plans and things like that. And I will tell you that that was uh, certainly not lost on me. And so this request would set aside uh, $50,000, which would give us roughly 150 to 200 trees um, to accompany our street programs in a given year. Uh, I don't expect taking a preliminary look at this year's program, I don't expect to, to buy 150 trees with even with all the mileage we're doing, because as you as you noted, a couple of miles of our five mile system is going to be the microsurfacing projects, and you've got some large industrial streets in there that are not going to be planted in the same, you know, same intensity. We're not, we we may consider planting some in, in some areas there, but I don't think we're looking at uh, the frequency that we would have in a residential neighborhood. So um, this would be this is designed to to set aside money that then. As soon as I get our street designs done, I'm going to hand those off to our forester and we'll try to uh, get comprehensive plans going on all of those streets. So um, I'll be coming back to you for more money when we need it. Might not be next year, might be the year after, but um, that, that's what this is designed to do so that we're not constantly tapping the uh, DPS operating budget. And I'm at I'm, the last two years I've asked you for contingency money, so I'd like to not have to do that. So uh, this is eligible through the major and local street funds, so we're going to charge it there. Um, infrastructure project number five, this is one the city manager and I talked about uh, fairly extensively with our downtown refuse collection uh, program where we're trying to convert this over to common dumpsters. Um, if we're going to do that, we need to set aside some dumpster enclosure areas to do this right and not just stick a dumpster uh, wherever we find a spot for it. So we don't know for sure what we're looking at for cost. It's going to depend on the size and what kind of materials we use. Are we using masonry? Are we using wood? Uh, you know, are we using some kind of vinyl? But we put two to four enclosures down there. The prioritization will be right now in the Riverside parking lot. But one of the other areas that we talked about last uh, two weeks ago at the work session was Woodland Cemetery and their dumpster that we have there. We probably will put that under our contract, build an enclosure there so that it's not uh, as visible to everyone. So whether that gets done with this year's request or not is going to depend on whether we can get all of the dumpsters done for the parking lot that we need to get done. And if that's the case, uh, we'll be looking at Woodland Cemetery as well. So Councilman Lamore has his hand raised. Your honor, so I'll pause. Yeah, I do. Uh, regarding the uh, dumpster enclosures, uh, have you thought about the utility section where the uh, where it goes down to the river walk uh, on, on east front that area right there is a possible dumpster enclosure uh, we haven't really gotten that far on the east side yet uh, we're mostly still focused west side of monroe street um, that is probably an area we'd be we'd be targeting to look at some way to do a dumpster uh, in that area because that seems to make the most sense of any of the places we would have east of monroe street 
uh, it's going to be difficult to find adequate common areas in, in that area. But uh, that, that, it, that would be one we're looking at. But we, right now, the first phase we're targeting is west of Monroe Street. Okay. I, the reason I asked the question is because, I, I'm sorry, the reason I asked the question is because we've had recurring problems with trash all over the place on East Front, uh, on the street, everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, it's just one of those things where we want to clean up the city. This is probably one of the better ways of doing it. I don't see it as bad in other places, but I, I can tell you it's really bad down East Front. Yeah, I, I agree. I've seen some pretty decent sized piles there next in the uh, next to the trash can next to Altrusa Park is another is an area that we, we frequently see it. Uh, you know, the challenge is we don't want to put it would be nice if we could have smaller dumpster locations um, so that we don't have have to have a, a big dumpster that's in sight of everybody, because whether you have a have bags in the street or a dumpster that everybody can see some people it's, it's six and one half a dozen in the other. But I think from a from a collection standpoint, it would be it would be better the more we can consolidate into those dumpsters. But um, it, the trick is going to be finding a spot that the the, the, the refuse company, which is uh, Republic for us for dumpsters, can actually get in there access. And I think in that utility uh, pathway down to the river walk, we don't necessarily own much on either side of it. So it would be a challenge of not blocking it with a dumpster. Um, so there's there's a lot more work we need to do on all that. And I expect that I expect that we'll be back here asking for more funding next year as well. Uh, hopefully well, I think we, if I'm not mistaken, Patrick, we have 50,000, uh, Ed, you can confirm probably better than I can, but I think we put 50,000 in this year's budget as well. So, you know, we're starting with 50, have another 50, and probably we'll continue to do this for a period of time. Mm -hmm. And if I might add, you know, just, I've, I've had some discussion with uh, Russell Design about, uh, you know, working with, uh, in this case, uh, you know, Patrick and, and Bill Walters uh, with DPS and, and Annette Knoll regarding, uh, you know, the uh, location, the design related to that. You know, we got 43 projects. Patrick's going to be involved in a lot of it. And so I'm, you know, much like I mentioned uh, the, uh, the uh, branded signs, uh, I'm going to have uh, Russell Design kind of take a lead. I mean, they'll be involved, but, but still. And, and Patrick's had good working relationship with Russell uh, with uh, Labor Park. But, um, we do want to get it uh, going here shortly, probably in the spring, and I'll probably have something with city council here within the next month. Okay. Patrick, okay. Patrick, a couple more. I think I've got the. I think I've got the last one. Oh, I, I don't know. If Councilwoman Germani has her hand raised, so I'll pause again. Councilwoman Germani. Thank you, Your Honor, Patrick. This goes back to the sidewalks. I'm backtracking a little bit. Um, do we have any leftover projects from sidewalks from 2020 that we need to carry over in 2021? Uh, no, Councilwoman, that's a good question. We, we, we never did get out and do the proactive marking. We had a long list of complaints, if you will, <laughs> because as you might expect, if we've gone three years without a program, we're, we're going to have the complaints built up. And that's, that's largely what we had been chasing is, you know, we do the proactive marking in the program area and that takes care of that. But then there's always going to be city trees in particular. There's just going to be random things that happen. We had a list of about 50 spot locations that we added to this year's uh, concrete paving program because we knew we needed to do something. We couldn't let the, and in, in many cases, these were city trees that were causing them and they were humping up two, three inches. So we, we had to get to those. those. Those weren't just one inch separation. So we, I'll say we blitzed them. We spent more money per square yard than I would have liked to because it's hard to get a contractor to bid on projects where he's got to do a square on this block and then drive three blocks over here to do another square. So the good news is we were able to flush out all of the complaints and we even took some complaints in late November and we're fortunate enough that we had the, the, the same contractor was able to come back in early December and finish up. So uh, we, we got really lucky this year in that I'm not aware that we have any carrying over to 2021, but we will we include those as well in the program. Even if it's not in the program area, we still give them what we call our spot locations. And we give them the opportunity to bid a higher price on those too, so that we're not, we don't have them dragging down the bid pricing for everything else because of a couple of spot locations. So so a gentleman in Mason Run, he was taken care of. I, well, I believe so. We 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 took care of, yeah, that was actually included in the original bid. That was a that was a standalone. Uh, because there was so much volume there, we were able to just bid that right off the bat. I don't know that he was 100% satisfied because we did not put sidewalks on the, on the frontages that had no homes. So like, for example, 
on the north side of uh, Elliott Street, there's just a vacant field. But there's, there's mm -hmm. sidewalks on the south side of Elliott Street adjacent to all the homes. And the same thing was true on Mason Run Boulevard. We had sidewalk on the entire east side as well as the west side south of Elliott where there's homes. But we did not do it on the areas where there were not homes because we there, there's very minimal benefit to that. I think he was concerned that we didn't do it in those areas. But I mean, we spent close to $40,000 as it was. So um, we, we felt like yeah. waiting for the redevelopment made more sense there. Got it. Thank you. But I, I think we did a pretty good job. I think he's reasonably satisfied with it. So thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Um, I'll go on to what I believe is my last project. You're probably tired of hearing me talk. So um, this one this one was kind of a late add on. Um, we, we looked at this as as something that if we had the funds in, in general fund capital to do that we should we should consider this because we keep putting it off. Um, this is another one of those that over the years, we've had a number of different ideas. I mean, even as recently as four or five years ago, we were looking at, you know, the fire station, maybe going on the parking lot across Macomb Street from City Hall. So we were looking at this being maybe we need to do something different. But after I don't know how many years, it's probably been close to 40 because I don't think we've done anything to this lot really since it since it was built. Um, it's, it's about time to do something. Uh, we I wasn't sure whether we wanted to do this project in concrete or asphalt. I think probably concrete because I'll be honest, getting a contractor to pave this, um, we can get a parking lot person to do it. Um, but they're pretty bit like we found this past year, a lot of those uh, contractors were really busy. We had, we struggled to get someone to do the labor park parking lot as a subcontractor um, in asphalt because there's just, it's more lucrative going with commercial projects than it is city work. For some reason, the smaller pavers don't, don't like to do it. Um, so we, we may do this in concrete. Um, a lot of the curbs can still remain. One of the things that I did want to look at, and we're, we're still scoping this as part of the second street job is I've had a lot of complaints about visibility coming out onto second street. When cars are parked in the angled spots to the east of our out drive, um, people can't see very well. So the question is, do we want to look at putting both driveways off of Macomb Street, which would actually, if you look at the parking shuffle we do, we would add a, add a spot where the exit is now, remove three city vehicle spots on Macomb Street and add four spaces on 2nd Street where the driveway used to be. So we'd actually be net one or two parking spaces when it was all said and done. Um, so that's, this is, a, we're still firming up the design, but I've got enough money in here that we should be able to do it in either material that we want to. So that is my last project. And then I want to talk a little bit just briefly on the long range projects we have, just to give you an idea of what was in our, our, our five year CIP, that's the, the five out years. Um, we're looking at about $18 million over five years, and that's $3.6 million a year. Doing 13 miles, which is about 2.6 miles per year, uh, 55 different road sections. And, in, and even though 2.6 miles a year doesn't seem like a lot, uh, the thing to remember is the first five years in the street millage, we're going to be doing almost all curb jobs where the curbs are poor and the streets poor. So we're getting caught up on a lot of those streets that haven't been done in 50 years. Um, beyond that, we've got a lot more mill and fills. We're coming up on the cycle now where we'd be, uh, I'll say, re-resurfacing the projects we did in the early 2000s, which were all done comprehensively. So I think we, after this first five-year cycle, we'll get a little more into bona fide perpetuity on this, um, where we're, we're cranking out the four miles a year uh, because we can do them, they're a lot less costly per foot. Um, I will say roughly half of our street program wouldn't be possible if we hadn't, if the voters hadn't entrusted us with the street millage. So um, I, I'm so thankful that they did. I know that all of us are thankful. Um, and we're going to try to, we're going to try to prove that we will spend this money wisely and aggressively to get these roads in, in good condition. Um, as, as Vince mentioned, we need to be aggressive, I think on the front end, because right now we've got low interest rates. And uh, I think with some financial uncertainty, a lot of bidders, if we get this in front of them early enough, will be um, chomping at the bit to try to lock down a certain quantity of work. So uh, that's what we're shooting for, for at least 2021. Um, the other, other infrastructure CIP, uh, I've got identified almost $7 million over five years and in other infrastructure. Um, Three million of that's two different airport paving projects and most of that's coming from federal and state funds. Uh, we, we identify 1.7 million in sidewalks and that would be kind of your perpetual program. But it, within the next couple of years after our trails project or trails uh, 
I'll say report is done, uh, trails plan, if you will, we can start identifying those gaps and start closing some of those gaps where we don't have sidewalks. Um, so that's another thing that we would be uh, beefing up our sidewalk expenditures for that. And then I identify the additional fleet purchases, alleys, heritage corridor, things like that, other tree purchases, dumpster enclosures. Um, and, and as the city manager mentioned, I think once we get our streets in pretty good shape here, uh, we can start looking at some alternative funding for things such as alleys, because those are not eligible through either the street millage or Act 51, but we've got a lot of them that are in fairly poor condition. And I think that's another way we can um, bring up the aesthetics of the community. And, and uh, I think when we raise our level of investment, um, our, our adjacent residences will as well. So that's a, a rising tide lifts all the boats. And I think that's what we're looking to try to do there. That is the end of my presentation. So I will uh, see if there's any other questions and I can go back to any part of it that you'd like. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, any uh, other follow-up questions from council? I know there's a lot of, uh, Brian, our councilman Lamore. Not necessarily a question, but just a comment. Uh, you know, Patrick, you're absolutely correct. Uh, I think the voters are gonna be ecstatic when they see the amount of work that we're doing to our roads, that the amount that we're investing in it, that they're investing in it. Uh, and obviously the proof is in the pudding. We'll see, you know, at the end of the day, what, what happens here. But uh, I think uh, from what I've seen in years past in our plans for the roads, this is exponentially larger than what we've done in the past. And uh, you'd have to agree with that, that uh, this is just a lot of work that we're trying to put through. And I think they're gonna be very pleased. Obviously the construction part of it, they're not gonna be very pleased about, but the end result, I think they're gonna be ecstatic about. Yeah, I, I would agree, Councilman. I mean, I think that's, that's, and as I said in our article on the newspaper, when they called to ask me for a quote, I said, this is not a city of Monroe problem. This is a United States of America problem. We have not invested in our infrastructure. And the fact that our residents see that and, and voted for that tells me they care deeply about their community. And uh, it's, it's my distinct honor to be able to uh, be the guy that uh, champions this. And, and I will do my darndest to make sure that we're, uh, we're, we're getting the biggest bang for the buck and we're getting the job done for them. So I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm excited. I spent most of the holiday break. Uh, couldn't, wait to get, couldn't wait to get rolling and, and get this year's uh, pro program out for bids. Other council uh, comments, uh, questions for Mr. or final comments? I, I just want to say thank you to the staff. I mean, you look at the uh, coordination and the amount of project that was mentioned by Council Lamore uh, is, is significant and working together between water, wastewater, uh, the uh, engineering and the other departments to make sure that we're doing things once, not twice. Uh, this was only a part of the presentation from the uh, work session. This was kind of the carryover. Uh, so I wanted the, those that uh, weren't able to uh, maybe are in this meeting, but uh, didn't uh, watch the work session you can go back and watch that through Impact YouTube. Uh, you can watch the entire city council work session and all the capital projects and presentations that were done. So we want to make the, uh, I want everybody to know that as well. So thank you to staff, Mr. Pass to any, I just said, is there a final comment on the uh, agenda item here we added on the capital improvements? Okay, I don't see any. Okay. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a couple of hands. I'm sorry. Uh, and I'm uh, Councilman Felder. <laughs> uh, just briefly, I got some comments that I think I'm going to email Pat Lewis later um, about some of the stuff, but for the interest of the meeting, let's keep it going. But it was nice to see both Chairman Schwartz and, uh, and Michael Madison from the uh, from the CPC show up um, as we were reviewing essentially stuff that's near and dear to them and stuff that they're going to be working on here um, of our committee members uh, coming to the meeting and, and and showing that they're interested, showing that they're involved. That was it was it was nice to note. I, I don't know if we're going to be able to note that we didn't have comments in the work session, so I just want to give them a shout out for for taking the time out of their schedules. Thank you for recognizing that. I appreciate it. Uh, Councilman Lord, you had a final, uh, other, okay, none. Um, and I know that uh, through their, our presentations, uh, obviously uh, review of the budget as well. And uh, as Mr. Pastu said, uh, there'll be some follow-up conversations of some of those items that we talked about and uh, look forward to that uh, follow-up as well. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Uh, Clerk Treasurer, uh, next item, please. 
Um, the next item listed is council action, but there isn't any uh, agenda item under that. So we'll move to consent agenda. And for item B, approval of payments in two vendors, the amount should read $414,743.27, 414-743.27. Thank you. Well, there's uh, on the consent agenda, there's one item. So if there's any items to be pulled from the consent agenda, if not, uh, a motion be in order. Council Felder. Yes, Your Honor. I would motion that all items on the consent agenda be accepted, placed on file, and recommendations carried out. Second. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's a motion by Councilman Felder, supported by Councilman Moore, that all the items, not just the item that was listed, but also the uh, minutes and the, uh, uh, the payments to the vendors. Thank you. That all items on the consent agenda be carry, uh, carried out. And accepted and uh, resolutions. Well, there's no resolutions being carried out and adopted. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilperson Whitman? Yes. Vining? Yes. Germaney? Yes. Lamore? Yes. Felder? Yes. Mayor Clark? Yes. Um, I have no further items, Your Honor. Thank you. It is the new year. It is January. Um, oh, I, I, Clerk Treasurer. <clears throat> Oh, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> this, I'm getting confused here. So it is January. It is the start of the year. Uh, Councilwoman Whitman, we'll start with you. Well, um, it's nice to be back. I had knee replacement surgery, and I'm glad to know I'm going to live. So, but getting around is a little difficult, which makes Zoom kind of interesting at this time. But um, I hope everyone had a wonderful holiday. I'm looking forward to a brand new year. And, uh, and I'm really nice. It's really nice to see people, even if you are in little squares. So I'm glad to be here tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. And uh, I'm glad your recovery is going well and Council as, as a whole. So it's great to see you and uh, back with us. Thank you. Uh, Councilwoman Viney. No comments, Your Honor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, Councilwoman Germani. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I want to thank Patrick and Barry, uh, the extensive work that they have done to put this together because I, it's a lot of intertwining work and it always amazes me how much the water department, <clears throat> how complex it is, all the inner workings and they work together so, so well. So thank you for the great presentation and I'm looking forward to the year to come. And actually everybody said how bad 2020 was, but actually I think as a council, we had a great year. We got a lot accomplished and we should look at everything that we have done and continue to do through 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Lamore. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, a couple of questions possibly to uh, city manager. Uh, number one, regarding uh, our lobbyists that we're uh, working on, when when would we see some of the fruits of his labor? Uh, that'd be my number one question. Uh, number two, have we ever looked into doing uh, like a marketability of our housing market for the city of Monroe? Uh, you got to figure that at some time point, these millennials, I want to call them millennials, uh, and the city of Detroit that live downtown are going to want to eventually settle in somewhere. And I, I can't think of a better place to settle in than in Monroe. Uh, just, just a thought there on that. And uh, we, we mentioned something about integration of cameras. I think that would be a, a, a great asset to the city, uh, especially in the Riverwalk area. And uh, that's pretty much all I have for this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Pastor, I there's a comment that you want to make any now or update? What I may end up doing is uh, having uh, Mr. Cochran, uh, you know, uh, just give the council an update at a future work session uh, with uh, with some of the work with the lobbyists. I mean, I, I know they identified three project areas that they're working on and then a couple of little regulatory items here and there that uh, they've had some discussion. So I'll save that for uh, another work session uh, for council. Um, the second item was uh, dealing with, uh, you know, market analysis. Uh, interestingly enough, we're doing the sub area plan for uh, Orchard East and part of it is looking at, uh, you know, the housing market there. But I think what you might be getting at is uh, 
related to the marketing of our community and its affordability. And I think a lot of what uh, the public or with the capital improvements program is, is going to the quality of life uh, issues, whether uh, uh, if we make it a lot more um, desirable and marketable, uh, go hand in hand, I think. And then lastly, I think in the upcoming budget is to probably put some funding in to do kind of a comprehensive plan as to how we would integrate a, a, a camera system uh, A to Z from where they're located, how we store her, and where we store those type of things. So, you're absolutely correct. Thank you, uh, Vince. That is exactly where I'm trying to hit on is the uh, our marketing of our homes that we have here in Monroe, and 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 basically the feasibility of living in Monroe, uh, and, and how good of an environment we actually do have here in Monroe, and and you know basically sending that out to other communities, uh, you know Detroit area, even the Toledo area. So I, I think that'd be something that we, uh, like you said, a market analysis of these other communities, showing them that, that Monroe is a very feasible place to live. Mm -hmm. Very good. Councilman Felder. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, just happy for the new year. Happy we all made it through 2020. Um, I'm excited, uh, you know, looking at the projects that are coming up in the CIP budget. Um, I know a lot of this we've been talking about for some time. It's nice to see these, um, some funding behind uh, some of the projects that we've been discussing, the council's been discussing. Um, I know that we are planning on doing a lot with neighborhood development, that we are partnering with some nonprofits for that purpose. Um, specifically in the Orchard East community, but I mean, uh, with Mineral Broad, I, I think I think we're doing okay. And as a millennial, if I may, Brian, I'm, I'm settling quite nicely. Uh, I can tell you that the four neighbors that I have that live closer to me are probably a lot closer to my age than they are to yours. So, well, I think I think it'll all end end all right. You know, we'll uh, we'll we'll buy up those houses from you. And, and looking, at, I mean, I checked the price of my home pretty recently. The market's doing pretty well right now. So, uh, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, that it's, I think Monroe's a, a nice and decent place to live. And I think that telling, uh, telling our, our neighbors around us and, and bragging about ourselves to them, it, you know, that's, that's probably worth doing. Um, hopefully we've shown the County and, and have developed a reputation for ourselves, uh, you know, in, in terms of development, in terms of the projects we're willing to take on in terms of the aggressiveness that we're willing to, to tackle some of these issues with and that we've shown that leadership, um, at least uh, on the duration that this council has been here. You know, the new year, uh, always bringing uh, to mind uh, our, our goal setting uh, strategies and, you know, from past years and is sort of a benchmarking of, of how we're doing compared to, to where we wanted to be. And I think that, that, uh, that all of us on here have done pretty well. Um, that I'd be willing to speak in our favor pretty highly. And, and I'm hoping that many of our neighbors in the townships and elsewhere would as well. I hope that that, that doesn't go unseen. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I definitely look forward to another year uh, with you all. I, uh, you know, it's nice working with all of you colleagues. I think we work well together and I'm very proud of the work that we're all able to accomplish. So here's to another uh, fantastic year. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councilman Felder. Um, so I just have a couple of comments. First is, because I have received a couple of inquiries and if council members have as well, here's the, the process in, regarding the trail advisory committee that we've uh, 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 made uh, steps forward to uh, establish. And uh, it's a simple process. We obviously want to make sure that we review those uh, interested uh, residents that want to serve on the trail advisory committee. I've simply advised them to, there is a, a one page application process for all of our boards, commissions and committees that can be filled out. Uh, if they, they, can, they can obviously contact city hall, it's on our website, it's accessible there. They can simply pencil it out, repent it out, send it in, type it out if they wish and uh, send it into the, uh, the city here, probably attention to the mayor's office. Uh, of course, Pat Weaver, as you know, uh, helps all of us with uh, these uh, tasks and we'll put those together and, and, and convene uh, uh, our group, uh, with the manager and talk about uh, getting recommendations to the council for service on the op opportunity for a, a trail advisory co committee. So I've sent a couple of emails back out to them and just advise that. I think it's important that we do that uh, through this uh, 
communication opportunity as well so as we move forward. Because I know that's uh, on the council's list for um, importance. You know, I, I just I was going to make one more comment after Councilman Feller and, and, uh, and other council members spoke. You know, the the Monroe News did a uh, uh, I would say a comment of uh, those in the community in different a sense of leadership, but also roles or titles. Uh, and um, and, it, and it's, it's tough in a hundred words to say, I, in my opinion, to say all that's been going well here within the city of Monroe because could have done that five times over easy, but. The two items that were uh, touched on by council members, I think is important. And one, first off, we are had our capital improvements. And I had just enough space to say we've done much in 2020 and in the past year, and we're promised for this year with many projects. And of course, the, the millage helps with that, but it's the staff and, the, and, the, and the, our conversations and the work here of how we move projects forward and prioritize them. I, I think of, of course, when we talk about the, uh, uh, in our orchard east and, and labor park what a, what a great asset what a great uh, improvement to a community and we have much more there through the opportunity uh, mcop's opportunity center at the alcc you know the national park they would have been open last year if not for covid and i think the community would have seen the uh, visitation I, they're open as it is but in open sense i mean the education and visitor center we we'll look forward to that opportunity here this year that the entire public can and participate see the changes that have occurred. I could go on, there's many of them, and I just wanted to touch on the fact that today's capital improvement presentation speaks to how much is being proposed. And I wanna thank the residents, of course, and their support through that millage. And, and I think, uh, uh, Councilman Felder, your, your last comment on how we work together, I thought it was important how we, how we work, not only as a council with administration, the efforts of our employees and what they could deliver in service to the community, of course, our clerk treasurer Lavoie in making sure that we have communications with our residents on how we appropriately do that and cover, uh, uh, make sure that we're listening as well as uh, communicating uh, to the public and, and working as a team. And so I, I've enjoyed the past year and all our years together and look forward to this year as well. I'll stop there and uh, clerk treasurer Lavoie comes this evening. I um, I don't really have any comments, Your Your Honor, other than just to uh, remind everyone that um, I know there are, there are bills to pay and taxes are are due, um, but we have many opportunities. You, Dropbox online, um, and we are available for payments. Um, so give us a call if you need something. Thank you, Clerk Treasurer. Yes, we still have a way to go uh, regarding COVID and, and uh, being safe. And But there's many opportunities for the public still to interact with the city and here at City Hall through the clerk's office primarily. And, and we're going to do that safe and cautiously. Um, Mr. Pastu, comments? Yeah, just to follow up on, uh, you know, 2020 obviously was a, a very difficult year, but a lot was accomplished. Uh, uh, I asked Patrick to put together how much work was completed, a uh, little over six million directly, but when you take into consideration the work that was done at the uh, um, River Raisin uh, Battlefield National uh, Park uh, Education Center, we're over $8 million, which involved a lot of uh, time and effort with uh, city staff uh, as well. Uh, you look at the four elections that the clerk treasurer's office and particularly the general election that involved a lot of participation with other departments, uh, you know, it, uh, it's quite an accomplishment. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of uh, the other projects, uh, you know, a couple that go unnoticed, uh, but certainly uh, Terry Davis uh, working with Ed Sell and the IT end of it, a lot of implementation of different programs and services to, to provide better customer service and, and experience and, and make it more convenient, more efficient for our operation. And, you take some small things like uh, our Medicare Advantage program that involved a lot of time with Mr. Sell and, and HR Director uh, Peggy Howard uh, uh, that, uh, you know, will end up saving over a half million dollars per year uh, with minimal impact on our retirees. And so, and then you go through all the, I can't tell you how many projects Mark's involved with, but uh, plenty uh, that, uh, you know, clearly with the demolition projects, uh, the housing acquisitions that go along with it, uh, so we've got a good staff and, and I do appreciate everything uh, 
you know, with uh, Jeff and, and Caitlin in the planning department and helping organizing this, plus the departments to put the capital improvements together. And, and it was kind of a mad rush here in the last week, but uh, as always, these good group of people uh, uh, find a way to get it done. And lastly, while the council works well together, city administration greatly appreciates that. Uh, there's nothing more difficult uh, when you're dealing with divisive city councils, and, and that's not the case here, which I think accounts for a lot of the accomplishments uh, that everyone's kind of pulling together. And, and while we may have disagreements on certain things, and that's actually really good, uh, but there is a good sense of what's in the best interest of the community. And so we greatly appreciate that. So looking forward to 2021, but 2020 was, while difficult, uh, a lot was still accomplished. Thank you, Mr. Pastu. I, you know, and, and of course, our, our the former Lazy Boy site. And then, as yeah. much as we wanted, so much achieved, it, it, so much was achieved, and where we're uh, stepping into 2021 with uh, some real positive uh, opportunities. And I look forward to the uh, uh, for future work session. The council are going to hear uh, from uh, um, Mr. Cochran not only uh, and the, the prioritization with our lobbyists, but also uh, updates of where we're going on these projects, I think would be a great way to start 2020 in one of our work sessions as well. I'm sorry, 2021, as we start in our work sessions and uh, really look for the long-term as we get through the year. So thank you, Mr. Pastu. Uh, Clerk Treasurer, I guess the next is citizen comments. And I don't see any hands raised at this point. Oh, there is one. Okay, so we'll see if there's, uh, we have attendees. I see one uh, hand raised at this time, if you would uh, promote them forward. Okay. And I believe it's Cole. I just are uh, mindful of the council chamber, or council rules in three minutes. Your name, please, and uh, uh, jurisdiction of residence, please. Uh, yep, Cole Bean, uh, 48162. First off, uh, happy new year, everyone. Uh, well, it's been lovely to you're hear. In, you're in the city, oh. right, Cole? Yes, that's right, City of Monroe. Thank you. Um, I did want to say I'm grateful for all the things and all the work that obviously everyone's been putting in and all the work that's getting done around the city. Um, I moved to Monroe about four and a half years ago, and I've really enjoyed living here. Um, it's a great location. It's between Detroit and Toledo. I've been taking advantage of uh, going to Munson Park pretty much every day this summer. Um, so I do want to say I am loving the love that you all have and I have for Monroe. And I would uh, just make a suggestion about uh, marketing ourselves in that the majority of, I know I'm hammering this all the time, but the majority of America is moving towards more progressivism and you know being very anti-racist and very open to diversity and sexuality and transgender and all these other issues. And I think Monroe has unfortunately, in some cases, kind of taken a more conservative viewpoint. And I think a lot of people see that and flock to the bigger cities. They'll leave Monroe, especially the youth, and move to somewhere they feel safer, more welcome, have more resources. And I would love to see Monroe move in a direction that like, provides more resources for the marginalized, the youth, the people who are looking for that that newness that what's next you know and not kind of being stuck in the conservative past so that's my my suggestion again i i love living here and i'd love to continue living here i just would love to see uh our city become more open thank you thank you cole uh clerk treasurer i'll see if there's other comments all right i don't see any other hands right nor do i so i'll go back to the other screen here. And at this time, the next item is adjournment. Uh, motion to adjourn, please. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion by Councilman Lamore, supported by Councilman Felder to adjourn. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilperson Whitman. Whitman. Yes. Bining. Yes. Germaney. Yes. Lamore. Yes. Felder? Yes. Mayor Clark? Yes. Thank you all. Have a great evening, and uh, we'll see each other all soon again. Thank you. Glad to see you back, Paula. Yes. Glad to be back. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, good to see you, Paula. Nice to be seen. <laughs>